What's happening, pal? Uh, how are you, sir? I'm doing okay. Doing I'm okay. Good. Two guests today. We've got two great guests. Yeah, this is our special law enforcement episode. It's the FBI day on Talking Sopranos. We have yes, two two actors who played FBI agents on the show uh, and were very, very important parts of the story, I have to say. Critical. Absolutely. Both of them. Yeah. We have Lola Glaudini and Matt Savito. Yes, we have Matt Servito played Agent Harris, Lola Glodini, who played Agent Deborah Ciccarone, a.k.a. Danielle from Whippany, a tremendous actress who did a fantastic job with a very specific character. She kind of had to play two characters in one in a, in a strange way, uh, and I got to act with her a bit, and it was really fun getting to know her and working with her. Um Born in Manhattan, has appeared in over 60 different films and TV shows, including Blow, Invincible, That Awkward Moment. She was a regular on Criminal Minds. She also appeared in NYPD Blue, King of Queens, Monk, ER, Ray Donovan, Law and Order, Blue Bloods, and seven episodes of The Sopranos as FBI agent Deborah Ciccarone, also Danielle from Whippany. She played two, two, two and one in a, an alter ego. Please welcome Lola Glaudini. Hi. Hey, Lola, yeah, how are is. you? I'm great, thank you. Thanks you for know, having me. I don't know, have we ever met? I'm not even sure if I've ever met you. Um, we passed by each other and waved once, but. I was probably drunk, I was probably drunk then. And I couldn't speak, so that's why I just waved to you. <laughs> how are you? Thanks for coming on. Thank Thanks you. for doing this. Uh, so, so let me ask you. So, you were born. You live. You live on the West Coast now. I live in LA now. Yeah. You live in LA, but you were born here. So you you started out as a New York actress. Yes, uh. I uh, was raised in New York predominantly, um, and then my mom is a native Angelino, but she eventually uh, went to New York where she met my father. And your so, dad but, was in the business as a playwright and an actor, right? Is that correct? Yeah. So my dad actually is my origin story of how I got into how I got into acting is um, my dad was an actor, a director predominantly of theater, and then has become a writer and as a journeyman writer now to this day is working as a writer. But um, he uh, started a theater company before I was born um, in Manhattan called Theater Genesis. And... Um, my upbringing was basically just like sitting around and, you know. Sam Shepard, it. right? Was Theater Genesis? Wasn't he involved yes. with that? So my dad started that with Sam. They started that together and he directed all of uh, Sam's plays. Sam was my godfather. And, uh, really? Wow. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. And Patti Smith worked there with it. Didn't she work with him on one of those early? Uh, yeah, Cowboy Mouth. My dad Cowboy directed Mouth. that. And my dad played the lobster man in that play. Ah. He also directed it. And John uh, Ventimiglia played the lobster man in a production that I saw of Cowboy Mouth. Well, he, he was in, you know, it's, it's a good part, good shoes to follow in. And, yes. uh, and um, yeah, so uh, yeah, Patty wrote that with Sam. And um, it, it's, you know, it's all in, my dad's in uh, Just Kids and all that stuff too. Yeah, so the book, so. So is that, that that's uh, how you got the acting bug? I mean, you kind of grew up in it. Yeah, I actually kind of didn't really know anything else. You know, um, my my whole world were the people that were around the theater company. And it was very, it was sort of a, it was a very, um, my upbringing was very unconventional. And I grew up in a, you know, a lot of, lot of parties, a lot of drugs, lots of, uh, uh growing up in a, in a, in an environment where like kids were just around there was no you know like Sam and Oland's son Jesse and I grew up together we actually our families like um we lived together for a while they squatted at the Dakota like I you know like we grew up <laughs> squatters squatted in the Dakota. at the Dakota <laughs> really? like you know like it was a weird upbringing um and uh you know my dad was a was um worked part-time as a bouncer at max's kansas city and you know i mean there you know they there's all kinds of just like odd jobs here and there and and all kinds of interesting people coming in and out was was um 
my upbringing at that time. Oh, a lot of eccentric New York uh, artists and characters that uh, yeah. should came in and out of your life at that uh, back then. Yeah. Now, now before uh, before you you were on The Sopranos, you had you had done quite a bit of work, no? Um, I had, but that was definitely a high water mark for me. You know, um, I I I recurred on NYPD Blue for a number of seasons. And that was sort of like my first TV show. And then I guessed it on all kinds of things. And then, um, and then when I got Sopranos, um, I was, I mean, I was a huge fan. And I actually came to it a season late. And mm. I was in a play with Rocco Sisto, who played a uh, young uh, junior. Yeah. And um, I was in a play and when he got Sopranos, and he was like, oh, this is going to be the greatest thing. You know, this is, this is like the greatest thing. Da, da, da. And I was sort of like late to watching it. And then I watched it. I got into it. And it was, I remember one of my best friends, uh, it was when you had, um, what was the kind of DVR that we all had originally? Betamax? Betamax? No, DVR. Oh. You, would, you would something it. I, oh, TiVo. 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 You know, and she TiVoed. Sunday nights. And so I caught up and, um, and I, I watched, I wanted to watch it cause Rocco was on it. And then, um, I became really, I was a huge fan. And, uh, one of my, my best girlfriends, Dee, Dee she would hold Sopranos parties. Like, you know, you hear everyone would have on Sunday nights where it's like, we would have potlucks and, and we watch it. And I was really, really just, Enthrall. I just thought it was incredible, and there were so many actors who I would see, who I would know, and and people's work who I would follow, and I was just so into it. And then I got the call, and you know, to audition, and it was just heaven sent. Was that the part you auditioned for? Did you audition for other parts before? No, I only no. auditioned once, and I was um, I I lived, I lived like I, I had a place both in New York and L.A. at the time. And I was, I remember I was in LA for a long spell and I, I got a call if I would audition for Sopranos and it was to put myself on tape. And this was before we put ourselves on tape. You know, this mm -hmm. is when you had to have like a, a video camera. Right. And, um, and I was so excited. I went, I went to um, Bonnie Zane, a casting director yeah. and I, I, she had just cast me in a pilot and I went to her and I said, would you do me a favor and cast, uh, tape this of me as though you were sending it to a producer? Cause I just wanted it to be legit, you know? Right. And, um, you know, it was before we had things that we could do that with and we didn't have iMovie and we didn't have, you know, we didn't have things that we could edit it and send it off and stuff. So it was a big deal. And she did me the solid and read with me and worked with me and, and um, she put it on her video camera and she sent it off to, um, to casting. And Sheila Jaffe, you know, called my manager the next day. Wow. And, and you, so you never went into the room for David? No, and I think that that was like unusual from what I understood later. Oh, yeah, oh, you know, yeah it I, is, very unusual. One of the few, you're one of the few. And, like, um, when I got that call uh, the next day, I was driving on the freeway and I got the call from my manager and she said, you got Sopranos. I, I was on like the 405. I had to pull over. Wow. I pulled over and I was screaming at the cars going by, I got the Sopranos! And I was so <laughs> excited. That, and it was like there was no one around. And I was just like... I was so excited, you know. That's a great call. That's uh, what Steve did the same thing. He was on the freeway, he pulled out, he was screaming. I he, got the, I did that when I got the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> when I found out I got the podcast. That's cool. So you got cast on, you know, I mean a, a lot of pe our listeners probably don't know this. Um nowadays that you you know, you film on your iPhone, a lot of people a lot of thing happens self tape. Back then it was very rare to get a job off a of video. I hard, I, well, to me, it was always like the death knell. They want you to put put yourself on tape. Always meant you're not going to get the role. You really have to be in the room with the director, or at least with the casting people, to make that kind of impression. Um, so that's pretty cool. 
Yeah. And you know, what you're saying is true because I remember when um, I got that call to put myself on tape, I was like, I'll get on a plane. Right. I'll get on a yeah. plane and go and read. And they were like, it's casting too fast. Wow. Put yourself on tape. That's the only way it's going to happen. Now, you took over for a Feruza Balk played, which a lot of people know or may not know. So she did one episode. She did the season finale of season three, which then we reshot. You reshot. Mm -hmm. So for whatever reason, she didn't come back. I don't know what that was about, if she got another job. So uh, I heard it was that she didn't want to commit to uh, coming back. She only wanted to do one episode. And then they said, no, we're going to bring you back for, you know, an, uh, what, came, what came to be seven episodes and she didn't want to. That's what I heard. It could be, you know. So, you know, the thing is, you know, so if people th don't have it on DVR uh, or on TiVo or didn't tape it themselves, that doesn't exist. I think it's on YouTube, but it really doesn't exist because you shot it even for the videos, you know, so it's all you, right? Now, uh, did you find it hard to play... You were playing Italian girl from Jersey. And then, you know, we also see you as this kind of, you know, very staid FBI agent. Was it hard to go back and forth? Were you familiar with those kind of girls? I assume you were since you grew up in Manhattan. So you kind of knew already? Yeah. And, and you know, I, I, I didn't find it hard. There wasn't too much back and forth, right? Because when I was playing the Danielle character, you only saw the real me at home with husband and baby. All right. And, um, and so I was still in Danielle and then it switched to the agent character right. really to play. And um, one thing that I noticed, and I remember talking to David Chase about this was um, that she was still Italian American, just like, you know, Frank Pellegrino was and Matt Servito's character were too, right? Even though they were feds and, and, um, and she still, they still peppered their language all, also. So it was like a parallel thing that was happening with the feds as well. You right. know, that they, their language was still peppered with Italian phrases and, yeah. and um, intonations and stuff. But to your question about knowing people like that, I did know people like that, but um, there was so much fun in playing that, you know, that, yeah. um, that it was just so delightful and, and delicious to get to go into that world. You know? Well, did you, um, base her specifically on somebody or what was your way into this character or characters in a way? Um, well, when I, came to silver cup the first time david asked for a meeting and we sat down and he told me information that the character was based on oh really yeah he told me about um not one person specifically but what these people are like and what they do and we kind of talked about it a little bit about um luckily i had sort of thought about it and and thought well how do you, it, you know, I said, is it okay if I base it on someone from Bay Ridge? And he was like, great, you know? Um, and I was trying to think of people who I knew like that, who were from a different borough who could go into some place like Jersey and, and not be known or something, you know, cause where it's just enough of a familiarity, but also just enough of a distance, you know? And they do this kind of thing. The feds. I mean, that's yes. totally and, what happened. And I, I had a bunch of questions that it was interesting because David, um, he was so, it was, it was, well, it was like, you know, meeting Oz, you know, when you're a fan. And so it was <laughs> like, um, he had a lot of answers, but then he also was that kind of sage enough person that says, I don't know when they don't know, yeah. which is like we, the sign of intelligence. You we know, know that. We know that. Saying, At least he know. spoke. At least he spoke to you. He didn't speak to me till season three. But uh, let me ask you something. Uh, in Piomai, it's kind of, uh, I don't know if it's the last time we see you, but Adriana sees you at the meeting uh, with the FBI, and you say you're going to be working with Agent Robin, whatever her name was. Uh, and she says, 
eat shit, Danielle, or whatever your name is. And then when she finds out she's not working with you anymore, she feels bad. Like, yeah. why? Why are you rejecting me? What, you don't want me anymore? I thought that was a, uh, you know, a really, I don't know. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, because she uh, had led on to you. She gave you so much personal information. Yeah, it's also the devil as you know, maybe, too. You know, like, at least at that point. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what And gosh, didn't Dre just play that so beautifully? I mean, just the nuances of, of that, you know, of, of being so resentful to that person and then still clinging on to it. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a good moment. Uh, she really feels bad. You know, she uh, talked to you about stuff she had never told anyone before. And I would assume for an FBI agent, I guess that sometimes they have feelings. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, yeah. they, they can't separate. I guess sometimes they get too close. I know they're not supposed to, but. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I kind of um, thought of this person as um, the FBI part of her as, as really uh, ambitious. In her climb the ladder you mean to climb the ladder because oh. like that was kind of a you know i was young and and that was a young agent to be involved in something like that and to be young yeah. and and infiltrating such a prestigious family that they were going after that was someone yeah. who who had some balls you know yeah and dangerous family obviously uh -huh. and dangerous. lola besides me who was your favorite character on the show Besides Bobby, who was it? Michael um, hates this. Michael hates this. I don't this. hate he gets, anything. He gets no. jealous. He I gets don't jealous. get jealous. I'm talking to Lola. Just stay there. Um, well, I, I just, you know, in uh, the, the Scottish play, Lady M is my favorite. And so I really saw a lot of that in Carmela. And so I just really related to, I just always was drawn to Carmela. Yeah, she was... Tremendous. Just that, what, the nuances of that role. What was your um, first day on the set like? Um, it, well, every day on the set was really like Christmas Eve to me. You know, um, I was giddy beforehand. And certainly the first day I was popping out of my shoes. But I was also like, I kept having to tell myself, Cool your jets, Glaudini. Cool your jets. Cool your jets, Glaudini. You know, because I was just like taking everything in, and um, and I just remember walking through Silver Cup, and you know, it was sort of like having gone down the rabbit hole, and everything looking real and and surreal to me at the same time. You know, like mm -hmm. being in suddenly seeing the sets and, and, and them coming alive from my imagination. But um, my first day was uh, the scene that we shot in your apartment. Yeah. And. Um, oh, when I come home and you're already there hanging out with her and I'm yes. kind of bummed out that you're, you're hanging around. <laughs> yes. And I remember, um, I remember, you know, Alan was, um, he was is it Coulter or Taylor? Which one? Coulter. Coulter. Coulter yeah. 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 Well, I, I've worked with a bunch, you know, subsequently and stuff. So it's just, he was a delight. And, and it yeah. was, he, you know, he, he's so charming and Texan and everything, you know, that he was just, uh, he, he explained how he was shooting it like a Vermeer and how he was lighting this, this sequence like a Vermeer. And I mean, I was like really taken by that kind of, detail and and attention and everything and and um not something you hear on tv very often no. on tv sets no, no. <laughs> yeah. and and um and then and everyone was so lovely the crew was so warm and welcoming and um and dre was so awesome and and she was like i'm so excited to have a friend and and so i just i felt so <laughs> um not not comfortable because I'm never comfortable, first of all, but but I as close to comfortable as one could be being a visitor on a set that's a well-oiled machine that's already a hit that you're already a fan of and all those things that are heightened. And uh, then to be there and it all be positive and lovely was it was just 
it was, it, it felt really good, you know? And then Michael, <laughs> I remember, uh, you were, I, I remember thinking when I first met you that, um, you were sort of standoffish. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And you got that right, Lola. You got that goddamn right. <laughs> and you were sitting in your, your chair off. I mean, I, you, you came over and you shook your hand. You're very nice. And ah, there you go, Steve. See, that's yeah. what he, he thinks I never do that or whatever. No, you did. You did. You shook, you shook yeah, my hand. Right, and you said, Hi, I'm, I'm Michael. And standoffish. And welcome, welcome. That kind of thing. Welcome, welcome. I welcomed her, Steve. You know yeah. what I mean? There you and go. Then we, read the pages and you know we kind of did the blocking blah 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 we maybe we shot some blah 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 and then you were sitting off to the side and i don't talk to anyone on on set who you know i'm 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 like a i don't talk to anyone right off you know it's like slow kind of a thing and 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 i i, I just looked over and you were you were reading kierkegaard you had like a Was dog-eared <laughs> dog-eared really? book reading Kierkegaard. <laughs> and I remember after my first day going back to my apartment and one of my best friends, Dee Dee, who, uh, who was such a fan of, of The Sopranos along with me, was like, what was it like? What was it like? What was so-and-so like? And what was so-and-so like? Da -da -da. And I remember I was like, Michael Imperioli was reading Kierkegaard. And from then on, that was your code name. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember that book. I guess I, I probably didn't understand it very well. Um, you know, it's it's not. I, I, I'm kind of shy as a person. You know, I'm not. I, I, no, you on, know, yeah. You know, it's like. Uh, I mean, Steve expects people hey, to like Lola. throw throw roses at his feet wherever he walks. Listen, it's shy, not always like that. Shyness and rudeness are cousins. <laughs> cousins. I don't believe that. No, I mean, okay. I don't believe that. Michael didn't even shake my hand. He high-hatted me from the beginning. <laughs> so you got all that right. Stand off his <laughs> You got it. Then I, he comes I out. I shy vibe. I will say that. I then, he the yeah, then he I'm comes out. Shy. He know. couldn't be reading the Post or the New Daily News. He's reading a fucking highbrow book. It's all bullshit. It's all bullshit. Why is it bullshit? I mean, you know, listen, I'm on the set for hours at a time. You want to get some reading. I probably had read the Post during breakfast, which I did every morning, or the Times or the News or whatever. I mean, this guy, is, the scrutiny I'm, I'm, you know, put, put up to is uh, incredible. But... But we, you know, I had a really good time working with you. I think once we started shooting, it was from the beginning. It was really fun. Yeah. And then you work, you, you work with Jim only once, right? The one only scene. Only once. Yeah. The the one scene. yeah. yeah. People then, shout that to me still. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, he, 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 he checked you out. Tony Soprano checked you out up yeah. and down there. Yeah. yeah. And now uh, King of Queens is constantly playing where you play the waitress, right? Yeah. And you, what, what was it? Is that the one where you compliment his cologne? I don't remember. I, I was his old flame. Oh, is that what it is? Because it, it it airs flame. constantly. Yeah. yeah. It's very yeah. funny. Did you get, when you were cast, were you guaranteed a bunch of episodes? Like, what was the, what did no. they say? No. Um, I didn't even know I was replacing anyone. I didn't, I had right. made up sides to audition with. You know, they gave me bullshit sides to audition with. And then, um, and they they just said, uh, you know, can you be a New York hire? And um, you know, it's probably one or two episodes. They, that's all they said. That's all they said. Mm -hmm. So you had no idea it was going to wind up being seven or where where no. you didn't know where it would go per se no. or anything like that. No, you, wind then, up, you did seven, right? I did, and then I ended up getting a, a series regular role on something that contracted me and so they right. we had to kind of write you know bridge me out was that boomtown I no that um, series it was point. um the handler with joey pants oh boy. all right hello and, hello how'd that go <laughs> oh it was great but we only lasted one season but uh it was a, it was a crash and burn but um oh. but i worked every day with joey but i had i had met him out to dinner one night on Sopranos with Jim and uh, I was invited like one night after, you know, come on, Lola, you come with us, that kind of a thing. And it was um, a night out, I remember, and we ended up, you know, all night, out all night kind of a thing. 
It was a night out that lasted 10 days. Yeah. Joey was a lot of fun to go out with. Yeah. yeah. A lot yeah. of laughs. A lot of laughs. Yeah. I became really good friends with him and Nancy, and we did a lot of sort of family vacation things together and stuff. Like, you know, we worked together a lot. So. Oh, that's cool. That was yeah. really cool. A lot of laughs. Well, Lola, thank you very much. I couldn't thank you enough for doing this. Sure. Keep watching the show. I'm glad you like it. And it really is uh, finally get to speak to you. Uh, it's a real honor and pleasure. You guys are great. It's really fun. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for coming much. on. Man. It's you great to care. have you. Of course. All right. See you. Take care. There you All have right. Lola there Gaudini, Agent Deborah Chicarone. Let's uh let's AKA take a Danielle from Whippany. Great interview. Thanks let's, for coming on. Yeah, she's fantastic. She really is. A great actress. And uh let's take a break and uh we'll get into the episode. All right. Very good, man. And you know, Lola was a fantastic interview. She played FBI agent, and now we have Agent Harris, an incredible actor and a really good fucking guy. I mean Yeah. This is part two of our law enforcement FBI episode. And I like doing this. I like uh, we have two guests on. They got a lot to say. Uh, uh, this guy uh, was born in New Jersey, Teaneck. Isn't that where Johnny V's from? Johnny V was, I think, grew up. He, I know he grew up there. I don't know if he was born. I think he was born in Brooklyn, but he grew up in Teaneck, went to Teaneck High School. Maybe Matt. We gotta uh, and ask uh, this guy played varsity football. He sang in the choir. So he had the makings of a varsity athlete. Yes, he did. Not only had the makings, he was a varsity athlete. He's a graduate of Juilliard. Yes, like Robin Williams. That's a big deal. And uh, Christopher Reeves. Right. That's a big deal, Juilliard. Uh, he appeared in close. He's appeared so far in uh, close to 100 different films and TV shows, including Enchanted Hitch, Compliance, The Blacklist, Law and Order, Billions, which I love, Homeland, Sex in the City, Tommy. He's, of course, been in Blue Bloods. He also has done a ton of commercials. Yes. I believe a bunch of stage work. I mean, this guy works more than anyone I know. Yeah. Uh, and he's a really good cat, and I appreciate him doing this. And a great, a great performance. He's done 24 episodes of The Sopranos as Agent Dwight Harris. Let's hear it for Matt Savito. There he is, FBI. Oh, he's he's they, got his credentials. Nice. Look at, this. Look at this. I like it. You saved that. That's a I beauty. found it. I was, I was digging through my drawers the other day, and I was like, wow. I, I, can't, I, I knew I had taken it. I just had lost it. But I like truly, like, I always love to grab something off the set when something's done, and that's, that's awesome. That's great. How you doing? I'm good. I really appreciate you guys getting me out of the house. Uh, I've been home with the wife and kids for months. I am now uh, I'm in my office. I got a little production office here in New Jersey. So uh, I'm having a little office party, holiday office party with you guys today. Nice. There you go. Yeah, I'm right. jealous. I'm jealous. So so uh, so you were you, you grew up in Jersey. You play in football. How do you get into the acting? Wait, I but were you at T-Neck, T-Neck High? Okay, so I was born in T-Neck at Holy Name Hospital. My mother's family is all from New Jersey. My father, the Italian side, from Detroit. When I was little, we moved to Detroit, and that's where I was raised. But we'd come ah. back every year to visit the family. Every time we went into the city when I was a little kid, I said, I want to live here. I can't wait to get back east. So the minute I could get out, as soon as I finished high school, I started auditioning for uh for, you know, drama schools back east and uh, never look back. Which part of Detroit did you live? East side of the city, if you can believe it. Yeah. East side. Yeah. It was, I said it was crazy because <clears throat> this is the 60s and 70s. It was the safest part of the city. They had a residency law. All the cops and firemen had to live in the city. So they all lived in the same neighborhood. So uh, nobody locked their doors. I mean, cop, cop, fireman. My dad uh, was a treasury agent. Um, but yeah, it was just a very working class neighborhood. Um and once they dropped that residency law, man, everybody ran. Everybody ran. The joke became the last one there, turn off the lights, you know. And, uh, so, so sad. But it's coming back in a big way, Detroit. So, Matt, so the east side is a bad part of Detroit? It is now. I think, in yeah. fact, somebody told me my former zip code, 48205, was at one point in the last five years one of the most dangerous zip codes in America. Well, and that's hard, sh to, hard to believe. I shot a series, uh, and this, we, we had a stage that was a factory that they turned in, and it was on the east. It was actually Highland Park. You know what that is? 
Yeah, the old Packard plant, I think, is yeah. what you guys were using. Or maybe it was the old Model T. They converted it for a TV film. Something like that. Uh, yeah. I remember I did an appearance for HBO uh, in uh, Warren, Michigan, yep. I believe it was. And uh, I, some of your relatives came up. Yes, you, were, you met my father, who was so gracious. Uh, you were so great and you were so good to him. And he always talked about it. And I said, dad, don't let him fool. He's not a good guy. No, nah, I'm oh, a said, Steve guy is so great. He gave, he took pictures. He signed everything. Da, da, da. I'm so, not, a, I'm not a big shot like Michael. I, I'm a, I'm a regular guy. I'm with the working class. Uh, I'm a working class fucking guy. Don't buy it for a minute. I know he's, he, he's slumming with you and me, Mike. He's totally <laughs> slumming with us. So, yeah. So uh, you wind up going, uh, you, you start in high school, you're acting, and yep. then you go right to Juilliard, is that it? I, so I did, and the crazy thing is in high school, I only did musicals. And I, But the thing that triggered it, I always said, if they didn't do West Side Story, I'm probably not an actor. Somewhere along the way, they did West Side Story, and I absolutely had a blast. I couldn't sing a lick, I couldn't dance much, but it was great. All the Italian guys played the Sharks, all the Irish guys played uh, the Jets, and we had this incredible production. And I Who did you play? I just one of the one of the sharks. I was just like another one of the sharks. Uh, I mean, I had a full head of black hair that we all slicked back, and and I went to an all boys Catholic school. The only thing we did with our sister school that was co-ed was theater. So I said I got into this business to meet girls. I'm still in it to meet girls. My <laughs> wife's not here. Um, my wife, believe me, she says it all the time. She's like, oh, so you worked with her and you worked with her. What a job you've got. What a tough, <laughs> tough job you've got. Um, but no, then I then I really said, OK, what's what's a really good school? I, I got to go for the moon here. If I don't get it, I should probably start thinking about something else. And uh, I just went straight to Juilliard. And uh, I, I, they, I was so raw. I mean, I know it because the audition, I remember talking to one of the teachers that put me through when I got in. And he said, yeah, we just saw a diamond in the rough. I mean, you had all this energy, you had all this passion, but you were a mess. I'm like, that's all I remember is that I was kind of all over the place. He says, but we saw something, you know? And so they, uh, they pushed me through. In fact, I didn't get in. I got a letter saying you're, on, you're an alternate. And a great life lesson. My mother had made me sit down, write a letter to the faculty saying, please, please just give me a chance. Give me a chance. And uh, I sent the letter off. And on my birthday in 1985, she called me. I was living downtown in Detroit at that time. She called me up and said, I got your birthday present. I said, oh, I can't get home today. I'm going out with my buddies. She goes, no, I can give it to you over the phone. You got it into Juilliard. Wow. Like, Is what? there anybody from, from Ju your Juilliard days that went on to, to do work that we might know? Uh, my, uh, if, well, if I stay specifically within my class, um, Bill Camp, who uh -huh. uh, I just think is Great one actor. of the Great. best character Great. actors uh, in the business right now. I just watched him in The Queen's Gambit. Um, Jane Adams was in my class. Lisa Gay Hamilton, just a fantastic actor. Oh, I've worked with Lisa several times. Yeah, Lisa's yeah. great. Um, Bill John, uh, John Benjamin Hickey. I've worked with him. Um, yeah, yeah I mean, just, just so many good folks. Um, and then just behind me was Laura Linney, Gene Triplehorn, uh, Jake Weber. I mean, all these other great, I mean, just, it was an amazing place. I, and like I said, because I got in as an alternate, I spent four years feeling like the scrappy kid that could. Like, I, I never wanted to be topped off. You know what I mean? It's sort of like, no, I'm just going to keep down here. You guys are the good actors. You're the really good actors. I'm going to keep working hard, and someday, hopefully, I'll be like you kind of thing. Hey, uh, Matt, isn't it highly competitive? I mean, in, once you're in, isn't it like crazy? Uh, I've read some stuff. I mean, is it like crazy competitive and dog eat dog? Is it really like that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but what a great light, what a great lesson for the business. Right. I mean, it, it, it right. really, it kicks your ass. You will many, if you interview like, and I've seen them interviewed a lot of my classmates, I've seen them on the tonight show. They're talking about jeweler. They're scarred. They're emotionally scarred. They, they really break. They used to, this is a very different system. Now uh, it's much more uh, touchy feely hugs and kisses. Now in the, from the sixties, deep into the nineties, it was still like smacking your hand with the ruler. They, broke you down emotionally. They wanted to rebuild you as an actor. It's like they'd empty the vessel, fill it with all this technique, passion, make you an artist, and then put you out on the street. And some people just fell apart during that process and never, the pieces didn't get put back together before they pushed them out into the world. So you'll hear a lot of, you know, they kicked out, you mentioned Robin Williams. They kicked out Robin. They told oh, him he didn't oh, graduate. No, He didn't finish, but because uh -huh. they, they looked at him, they said, you're amazing. Like, we don't think this is the place for you. Like, this is classically trained. You're like 
on your own stratosphere, you know? And Robin always said, like he was, in fact, he used to come back when I was at school and uh, do Q&A or do like a comedy workshop. Like he had no, he said it was the best thing that Juilliard did was after two years, they pushed me out the door because I was ready. I was ready to go do what Robin Williams does, you know? Wow. Very cool. But yeah, I mean, you're intimidated by the, the graduates. I mean, it was, you know, at the time, Val Kilmer, Kevin Klein, William Hurt, Patti Lapone, Christopher Reeves, who you mentioned, uh, Bill Hurt, uh, God, it was just, so you're, and they've got their pictures up on the wall. So you're just like, oh, so you have to become a movie star. <laughs> you know, you're like, oh shit. No, not, no pressure. No are pressure. you, are you up there now? I am. I did a production. Right. I did a production of King Lear when I was there. So you would never rec. the picture is me with like this old gray beard. I got all this makeup on and I'm doing King Lear. It's, it was an incredible performance, but basically a 26 year old imitating <laughs> Probably what I thought 55 year old guy would act like. <laughs> so, so did you start uh, working while you were at Juilliard? Did you get an agent? Tell me how that goes. Right. At, yeah. So basically that's, I was, when I talked to students, they're always like, so how, you know, how did you get uh, where you are? And, you know, I said, listen, my story's bullshit because they said, when you go to Juilliard, it, it literally is like you, you don't even play triple A. They send you right to the majors. They said my wife waited tables for seven years and then got all three of her union cards in one year. So that to me is a more traditional New York actor story. I said, Julia, they would come to school. You'd see a note up on the bulletin board agents wanting you to call them. I literally called the first one to put a note up. J. Michael Bloom. I don't know if either one of you guys were ever there. I remember that. I remember. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. Uh, Michael Bloom put a note up there. I called him, went down, signed, you know, three-year contract. They got me on a soap opera before I even got out of school. I was going to do all my children during the day and then going back to Ju Juilliard at night to do theater. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. Crazy. Yeah. That's a whole different deal. They, they at, at a lot of these schools, Carnegie Mellon, Juilliard, and, and uh, USC Yale. and some other ones, Yale, Yale. They, the agents go to you. Yeah. As opposed to you, uh, you know, they're always scouting for the newest and the youngest uh, guy. So how do you wind up? Uh, tell me about the Soprano audition. How do we get there? Oh, man. Um, so that jumps ahead. I did a bunch of daytime and then I and then uh, I finally just got had to get off of the, the uh, soap opera racket. So I just said to my agent, no more soaps. I'm looking for legitimate stuff. <laughs> when I first saw the title, The Sopranos, I don't know how you guys were. I was like, the hell is this show? Like, what's this title? Like, The Sopranos. I'm, you know, I actually auditioned. Uh, I don't know if he was in the pilot for Father Phil. Was my oh. very first audition uh, for the show. Uh, I can't remember if that was in the pilot. I think so. Yeah. I think it was. So I, I think uh, Georgiane had me come in. That would have been a whole year ahead of when I did, when I came back. She had me come in, didn't get the part, uh, but I was kind of like, oh, this, I think this show's going to be good. So then, like, cut to, I think, at least a year later, it's still season one. Uh, they call me to come in for um, an FBI agent, uh, Grasso, uh, Agent Grasso. And I Frank, go, that, was that Frank Pellegrini? Frank Pando ended up playing oh, that Frank role. Panda. Oh, Frank Pando. Yeah, not Frank Pellegrini. Uh, oh, that was Cubitoso. Right? Cubitoso. So they, uh, yeah, they called me and said, can you come in? I went in. David had me read. He's studying me. He's looking at me as I finish. He goes, can you come back tomorrow and read for Agent Harris? And I was like, sure. I, you know, and it was the best thing that ever happened because Grasso, uh, Grasso was gone, you know, in and out for only a few episodes. Harris, they extended, obviously, for the next seven, six seasons, uh, whatever we call it, six and a half seasons. So uh, that changed everything. And But again, I still... Didn't know. I mean, so that brought me into the show. It was the one off one episode. I'm sure you guys remember. I show up at his back door. Uh, he, <laughs> Jimmy Donis goes up to the maid. He goes, Warrant, Warrant. It's funny. Very funny. He, I, didn't like, uh, he didn't like that maid. He never liked that Polish maid. <laughs> I love that relationship. That was great. Um, what was so, your way uh, to get into the character? How did you approach him? Did you base him on someone and, 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 Part two of that question would be what kind of did you have access to some actual law enforcement people? I had just I mean, obviously, you know, uh, I had played cops, a lot of like New York City cops. Um, I had just come off on the even on one of the soaps. I think I played like a small town detective. Um, yeah, the Fed thing was much different. I had one friend who uh, from school that had gone on, you know, to be an FBI agent. Mike, I, I got to be honest, the first episode or two, I just didn't think I was going to stick around. So really, I just wanted to hit the mark, say the lines, 
you know, kind of just be be there, compete, uh, be with the actors, kind of be on their level. Yeah. And then I'll go home. Like, I didn't think this was going to be an extending something that would extend out. Once it did, uh, David brought me to some FBI guys. Um, another guy that I met at a party, he ran uh, a clinic where you go out and uh, he it, it's for civilians, but he, he puts you through training. Uh, like a fantasy camp? Kind yeah, of? yeah, like a fantasy camp for, for like CIA, FBI. They put you through the, 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 the small arms fire, through interrogation techniques, through, um, you know, uh, studying on a stakeout what kind of things you look for. You know, I mean, it was great, really, really great. So you're that with <laughs> these guys. Would, I don't know if you guys probably didn't see them. David would, would invite people to set and they'd just be watching the scene. And then they'd kind of sidle up to me and be like, Hey man, I'm uh, yeah, I'm FBI. Uh, David invited us. Man, we just want to say we love what you do. That's great, you know. And so then I'd start picking their brains. They were always kind of coy. I, I don't know if they didn't. David didn't want them to know. I want us to know that they were on set. But he had relationships with guys uh, at the bureau that also I think kind of um, uh, vetted some of the the, the storylines and scripts. I think I don't know. If that, I, I can't say I ever confirmed that with David, but. Every guy I've ever met from the bureau that watched the show said, you guys nailed it. Like there, there, there's even things in there that only somebody from the bureau would know. Right. And yeah. now did, did David ever talk to you about your character? I mean, because some of us, he spoke to more than others. Did, <laughs> did he speak to you much? I mean, David, uh, I probably spoke, spoke more to David at the Christmas party every year than I spoke to him the whole season while we were shooting. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, it, he was it, he was an enigma, uh, Mr. Chase. But, you know, uh, uh, the one thing I loved about David, he had a really dark sense of humor. Yeah, um, great sense he, of humor. I, I, it's yeah. just the one thing I wish he had made, you know, s since the show's over, I really thought I'd love to see him make a comedy, like a straight up. You know, I know things like, um, you know, uh, oh, the music show, uh, vinyl. You know, it had elements of funny characters, but I, I think David loves to laugh. I just think I'd love to see him do a real broad comedy. You know, you know at one point he was considering doing a spinoff of The Sopranos as a half hour comedy called The Bacalaws. No. I'm not kidding. I remember oh talking to him about it with Steve and uh, Aida. Yeah. Oh man, that like, would have been fantastic! Oh my God, single camera. I nixed it. I, you know, I, I told sure him. Get out of your mind. <laughs> David. Listen, Whatever listen. you do, don't do that. You what about what? the Montesantis? Christopher's you know alive. Matt, the thing is, is that I already knew that without him even. <laughs> of course, I fucking knew that. Yeah, he squashed that. <laughs> I knew Michael was. Are you crazy? Away. Are you fucking crazy? Uh, I never, yeah. I never Matt. saw Imperioli or David Chase in the same room, so I'm thinking it's one in the same. But that Matt. is true. He did think about that at one point, which I think is kind of, you know, kind very of. But it's very telling about him as a person. Like I said, yeah. the world treats him, you know, like an artiste and an auteur, and you know, but really, David is a, just a guy that loved good story, liked to have a good laugh, and very yeah. easygoing. But, but, but again, not a chatty Kathy man. Like, like I said, I always loved at the holiday party because he was usually there with his wife, and we could sit and chat and laugh and talk about other stuff kids family life you know uh who was your favorite character on the show oh man. besides bobby of course yeah i mean truly uh uh i would say god i i mean it, it's so hard because she was you know she was only there such a short time but i, I thought livy i thought nancy marchand was like i was such a fan of hers even before the show i mean what an amazing woman and talk about a character that just took over the show. I mean, her presence, the way she played, and what people have to know is she was nothing like that character, you know, Nancy herself. So uh, I, I, I know it's that might be a cop out because she was there only a couple seasons, but and but also uh, Carmela. I just thought Carmela was, you know, so fucking great. I, I love Edie, what Edie did with the character, how she never kind of crossed over, never got cartoonish, was always on point. Um, so, you know, I love all the female characters. I know it's such a guy show, but so many, I thought so many of the women uh, made the show what it was. Can you uh, explain or elaborate a little on, you know, as the relationship and, and the, the story went on and the relationship between Harris and Tony Soprano went on, yeah. there were points where there was actual kind of respect, mutual respect or kind of sympathy. Um, I know the sending of the gifts for the birthday. That was that's more of like a stick it to him kind of. We know you don't forget us. We we're, yeah. we we got you in our in our sights. But 
there did seem to be some kind of mutual, I, I, is it respect or how would you put it? Um, you know, I think that's one of, there's a couple of things to that. I think one was, thank God, because otherwise, um, I always describe the relationship as uh, Wiley Coyote and the Sheepdog in Looney Tunes. <laughs> they both punch the clock, then the Sheepdog chases Wiley Coyote all day. And then at the end of the, the episode, they go, good night, John, good night, Bob. <laughs> And I that's mean, very what, good. Yeah. That's really what was happening. Because, I mean, I would come to the pork store and sit. I mean, you, <laughs> Christopher, tell me to, like, fuck off. But uh, Tony come and sit and I'd have an espresso and we'd just kind of chat. I'd give him a little intel. He'd give me a little intel. I mean, that's only in the later seasons. But that changed everything for me with the show because the fans who hated my guts, you know, because of this for so long, uh, all of a sudden, uh, we're like, oh, I love your character, man. I'm like, really? Oh, now you love me because I'm giving him intel and I'm not chasing him anymore. Now I'm working on anti-terrorism. But uh, it, it really, you know, and I think in the end, Michael, also the thing that the sh I think the huge appeal the show had, because I always said, OK, fine, it's, you know, mob, it's this. But now, I live in Jersey now. When we shot the show, I lived in uh, Manhattan. And now out in Jersey, I am Tony. I am just another suburban Jersey guy with three kids, pr suburban problems, you know. And that's the thing. Tony, there's a great scene. I can't remember what episode. Tony and I are in the car and he's looking for some information on uh, Phil Leotardo. And my David, I just I love this kind of writing. Just a subtle little thing. He has my wife call my cell phone, you know, while I'm on, on talking to Tony in the car. Snowing, we're at Teterboro Airport. And Tony, you know, Jimmy, Tony's talking. I say, hold on. Fuck. What? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what time I'll be home. Yeah, just leave it on the table. Yeah. Uh, why? Why can't you? You know, and and the great shot is just Tony watching me, you know, kind of sideways. Just, and he the sympathy. He's looking at me. He's like, this guy's been chasing me for 10 years and he's got to go home to the same bullshit I do. You know, and I think that that's why the show was so good it went it, it transcended the mob thing it transcended right. you know all of those sort of cliches and went deep into the psyche of just you know uh, uh, right. the middle age the, the, the mid-century middle-aged man i think right the typical way to go would be like the cops and raw you know you're you're the deadly enemies and you're just pursuing him and you're relentless and he's evading but that getting into that gray area middle ground is, is why the show is so great and it's so oh, much yeah. more human right yeah yeah there, there was no i mean there was no heroes i mean that's it, even harris in the end even my character my character got his hands dirty i was giving intel to the mob right. i mean there, that's what i said everybody there was no it's all anti-heroes you know everybody's just trying to get by doing what they're doing you know uh, you worked with jim mostly and I know he enjoyed working with you because he had told me he thought uh, a lot of about your, uh, you know, about you, uh, your role. And how was that? You know, uh, working with him, um, you know, first of all, uh, you know, love him, loved, uh, you know, Jimmy, the man. And um, he the thing is with you guys, and I can say this, it's interesting being interviewed by you guys. I'm sure you, you know, we've all done a lot of interviews over the years about the show, podcast, TV, radio. It's the first time I've ever been talking to people from the show about the show uh, on, you know, in a live situation. But I was just an interloper. I, you guys were the show. I mean, I, I, I it's weird. I'm, I'm one of the there's a handful of us that uh, were just passing through. And sometimes, and I eventually did become part of the fabric of the show. I did become more than just a stunt. Absolutely. Uh, you know what I mean? And I felt Absolutely. that, Michael. I really did. By by season five, I felt like I belonged there. And that and David said, I want to get you into the show. I want to bring you in. And that's what when they changed and made me anti-terrorism, now I have to work with the mob. I have to work with Tony to get information about movement in the in the uh, the, the, the harbor, in the ships. And um, but I, Jimmy was always, again, a little bit like an enigma, like David to me, that, um, I, you know, he he was uh, such a big teddy bear, again, had a delicious sense of humor, loved to have a good laugh always. So we spent a lot of time doing that. But, you know, I, I saw what the role, what the f notoriety, the fame did to Jimmy, uh, both in the as an actor and as a human being. And so just watching him, he began to relish our time together, like as the show went on, because if you were part of the show, I'm sure you guys felt this. Like he, I remember seeing him after the show had been over for a few years at the Emmys, some party in LA and he was off by himself, like eating all the food off to the side. 
and he, I just waved and he looked at me like, oh my God, get over here, get over here. Like it was like an oasis in the middle of a desert. Like he was so happy to see somebody from the show that had, you know, that connection. Um, but like I said, it, it, that took a long time for us to get to that place because I was, like I said, I just was, I just was so grateful to be a part of that show. But by the time I was kind of getting into it, um, you all, as you guys know, you only work with the people you know that your your storyline. Because sure. you know, you guys know this. People ask all the time, "Oh, what's uh, you know what's what's Dan Grimaldi like?" Well, I I didn't have any scenes with Dan. Well, what's Edie like? I'm like uh, I had one scene in six years with Edie. You know, okay. I mean, yes, I see her at the parties. Yes, we have functions. You know, press and stuff. But it, it you could go long stretches of time. But yeah, most of my stuff was with Jimmy. You know, and some days were pretty much let's just do the work and go home. Other days or a laugh riot other days we'd you know we'd have to really kind of push through to kind of find the scene um but i always felt protected i always felt like he had my back anytime you know he'd look at me he's like you want another take do you not feel good and i'm like you know no no i'm good no 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. don't stop stop moving we need one more we need you know that kind of yeah. stuff those little yeah. things you know anyways i could go on and on but you know the to the gym working with jimmy was um uh, uh, just truly one of the great, you know, things in my career. You know, Matt, people ask me, what was it like working with Michael Imperioli? I say, I have no fucking idea because <laughs> every day he's a different fucking guy. Sometimes he's my friend. Sometimes he hi hats me. Sometimes he barely knows my name. So I understand what you're saying. Well, I, I mean, listen, I, I'm telling you right now, I'm sure and you guys have worked on a lot of different shows. That show was highly unusual that I'd say one through five on the call sheet were very private people, not traditional actors, not like I want to be in the spotlight kind of people. Michael, Edie, Jimmy, Lorraine loves, I mean, Lorraine could handle that. And she had kind of had that background, but I said it was a show that really the work spoke for itself. People were, you know, uh, uh, working, working actors that loved the, the craft, that loved the, the script, that had respect for each other. I said it was very unusual in that sense because I feel like st that there wasn't a lot of, um, you know, other shows. Sometimes the set is a lot of fun on other shows. Some shows were like, you know, nobody really cares. It's a paycheck. This was such a, a hybrid that I've, I've never worked on a set like it since. I don't know what you're Most of the people hadn't really done you know, series regulars before. Yeah, yeah. You know, most of them done movies in theater, you know, and uh, I think that's part of it. Is there a scene of your work, your performance, that really you hold on to as like, I nailed this one, or this meant a lot to me, or, I, you know, a particular moment or something that you did, you know, that where you felt you really, you know, yeah. you, you did what you wanted to do with it? There, there's only one scene uh, on my reel from the show and it's not, there's nothing special about it. It's just special to me. It, it is one of those scenes at the pork store and I'm eating uh, yet again, eating another fucking sandwich shit that put me in the hospital. I swear to God, like take 20 and you're like on a hoagie. That's like, Oh my God. <laughs> and they're good. They're delicious. So I'm eating like, I'm eating a lot on every take. Um, but uh, it's just a scene where I tell Tony to watch out uh, that Le Phil Leotardo's put a hit out on him. And it's, it's a small scene, very intimate. And he's like, why are you telling me this? You know? And I say, it's Christmas. That's it. And it's, it's just me, I'm eating and I, and I kind of like, Hey, how you doing? He's like, yeah, you know, whatever, agent Harris, what's going on? You know, it's, it's just a small little scene, but like Jimmy and I just, and I remember like we kind of got it in the first few takes and Alan Taylor was like, I don't even want to cover this scene. I don't even want to punch in it. Like, I'm done. This is beautiful. It's a great little moment. The way he framed it, you know, with the Satriales, the thing, and the two of us just like sitting at a cafe table on the inside. I love that little scene. It, 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 I remember going home just thinking that was, that was lovely. I just, you know, it's not, there's other scenes that were bigger, you know, and emo more emotional. As I said, I love the scene with Jimmy in, because uh, it was a real snowstorm. And we were in a car at Teterboro Airport. It was probably four in the morning. We were freezing, exhausted. And there wasn't much acting going on, just two guys kind of hitting the mark, saying the lines. And uh, but I just remember just sitting in the car between takes, talking, laughing, you know, snow coming down, thinking, this is amazing. Look what we do for a living. This is incredible. And Jimmy always felt that way. Like, can you believe this is what because he's from where I'm from. Like when you come from that, and you guys, too, you know, I, I, I came from a neighborhood. People had to freaking work, man, like work. 
And here we are just waiting for our lattes in our car in a snowstorm. Because you we're looking outside, people are moving cameras, lights, you know, all the real work's going on. And we're just like, come on, I want to go home. Well, you should have done the Pine Barrens episode. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, exactly. There was no lattes being delivered out, out in the woods there. I'll tell you. Hey, right. for your art, that was that was yeah. art. Let me ask you one, one last question. You worked with Frank Pellegrino a lot. Did yes. he ever give you a table at Rayos? Fuck no, Frank, <laughs> no. Okay, I got there. I got there on my own. And man, did I just look at him from across the room like, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, motherfucker, you did nothing. Because I knew I worked with him the whole time. And what a lovely, again. Oh, lovely, I know. Lovely. He was Terrific the best. guy. Truly. Terrific and, guy. The best. And, what a, And again, such a character. You know, it's so funny. He used to... Uh, First of all, he told great stories uh, and and that great voice of his, good singer. And he, he spent a big chunk of like two seasons reading all the Harry Potter books. And he was always telling me, Matt, you got to read Harry Potter. It's incredible. He just loved, loved he was a huge reader. Um, but he, uh, no, I, I knew if we were going to get along, I had to not ask him for a table, for a reservation. Because everybody that asked him, it just made him uncomfortable because... Wow. Obviously, the nickname, Frankie No, you know, it's like Jesus Christ. He'd be like, ah, eh, Jesus, I don't know. You know, <laughs> it's like so a friend of a friend kind of thing happened. Uh, and I'm like, I'm like, got a last minute call. I mean, I think it was, you know, six. You got to be here by 630. I'm like, I'm, I'm out the door. And it was incredible. I mean, I would say, listen, you know, it's first of all, it's just getting into the Holy Grail, like getting inside. But it's the experience. The food was good. Was it amazing? I mean, I think I've, I, Il Molino. Not just the food. It's, it's the not the food. Experience. That's what I'm saying. It was a night of singing, laughing. I mean, oh, there's Billy Joel over there, and there's it's a New York um, moment. Yeah. You know, you can't you can't no, fake it, that it, or yeah. invent it. Or and that's and vibe. that's what it was. It was the authenticity, Michael. Exactly. Yeah. Like it was so amazing, and I just was so glad. I went back one more time uh, with my father, who was begging me to go before he died. So we went, just sat at the bar. My dad was a pig and shit little glass of red wine, seeing all the characters, all the people coming and going. My dad was even happier. That was more his style. Like he wouldn't even have wanted to be at a table and have Frank come and make a big deal. Like just sit at the bar and be a fly on the wall. You know, Nice. listen, Matt, I couldn't thank you enough. Really? Oh, guys, I, I appreciate talk. you doing Don't make this. Me go home. Don't I got, <laughs> come on. Man. So season two, I'm, let's go. I want to go back. Right. Uh, thank you very you much, man. You take hey, care. We'll see you, see you soon. soon well, all right. Thank you. Take care. You be well, pal. Thanks a lot. All right. That's a veto. You know, I didn't know they had FBI fantasy camp. It gave me a really good idea. Talking Sopranos fantasy camp. Oh, really? And then what do they do? What, what's going to happen? We then? give them the whole experience. They One guy, you know, they could choose to either be me or be you. Okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> they get to sit with the curtain behind them. Somebody films them. Andy's in their headphones, giving them instructions. They get to interview somebody from the show. So Talking Soprano podcast fantasy, fantasy camp. camp. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. I, I agree. I think it's a great. You you have some good ideas. I'm, I'm full of them, man. I I'm love it. Them. I love it. Let's, uh, <laughs> Let's we'll take be a back. break. All right, man. You know, you know, I got to tell you something. A weird part of... Uh, a weird part of watching, rewatching the show. I mean, I was so young then. You know, I was fat, but I was young. And I was, I had no gray hair at all. And now I'm looking at this shit hanging down. Look, it doesn't even move. Wrinkles, old, broken fucking down. I got to be honest. That's how it goes, my friend. That is life. You know what I mean? I mean, if you would have saw. 20 years when you were on the Sopranos and saw pictures of yourself from 20 years before the Sopranos, you would have looked, you know. Yeah, but I didn't have that many pictures then. I wasn't on film then. Now, no, I know. And everyone compares you to how you look then. And uh, I mean, you know, I, you, I'm saying I'm, I'm watching this episode, Pi oh my, and, you know, just a younger guy and more vibrant. I moved a little quicker, even being fat. But still, no, that's it. That's it. You know, in Buddhism, they talk about impermanence. That's that, that's a good teaching on impermanence when you, you know, see how much you've aged and that it happens. And that's unavoidable. That's why you got to be grateful for what you have for, for today. Right. 
Grateful that you're in the moment, sitting across from me virtually on this show. And absolutely, I got to tell you, you know, every I, day. you look at you. I look at myself now on Blue Bloods because we're watching The Sopranos. You look at that. I'm going. I'm an old man. I mean, you can go the whole plastic surgery route and see if that can help. I don't what do you know. think? We'll do. I wouldn't. What do you think I would? What What, what do I need improvement on? Uh, the bed. I, I don't think. I mean, you, it, listen, look, do you look, think you'd get more work if you did that? No, probably look, not. I, I think maybe if I got rid of the bags. Maybe you think I'd, you'd get more, more acting work? I think more leading man type stuff. Uh, you know, and the, my, my nose is way big. Maybe if I. It got more of a Michael Jackson type thing happening. Now and, you're talking. And get rid of the bags, dye my hair. I don't dye my hair. You don't have that much gray. You, you know? What are you worried about? Uh, uh, you know, maybe a little, a little liposuction here. A little liposuction. Look, get rid of some of this. What do you think? They got doctors that could do it. They do maybe, that in an afternoon. That's Maybe nothing. the stomach, washboard. I get some abs. They, they have those abs they could put in. <laughs> <laughs> What you, you might get a whole new career out of it. What do you huh? think? My hairline is up high. Maybe they could, you know, size spurling, a little hair club for men shit. And huh? do you think it would make a big difference in your life, your enjoyment of life? You'd feel better about yourself. Maybe my wife will get more, you know, maybe my wife might get more aroused if she saw a younger man. Well, you wouldn't be a younger man. You'd be the same, <laughs> just weird looking. <laughs> uh i don't know what the answer is my friend you know you listen know. I, i'm i mean i'm gonna be 55 very soon it's like there's no i mean i can't have, i'm have not you had 35. any work done have you had any work done <laughs> on my house i have yeah <laughs> uh, no i have not had work done um you listen, know it, it looks I'm, really bad on guys you know, like women, you know, listen, there's, I'm sure there's a lot of women that had work done that you don't know, you know. Yeah. But like on God. It's a lot harder in this business. They were judged and, and still are. I mean, we, you know, things have changed a lot, but they're still judged on there. Looks much more so than, than guys are, you know. You can have an older guy with a younger woman in a, in a TV show and no one says, uh, says a word. And if it's the opposite, it's this big issue. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not fair and it's very hard. Uh, there's a lot of pressure uh, on on women, to, uh, especially, well, yeah, because, especially you know, in show business, not well, just in show business. Well, especially if the if the woman was kind of the played that good looking sex symbol type of role, yeah. you know, uh, they expect that to be even when she's way older. They're still saying, "Oh my God, what happened to her?" You know, guys, yeah. not so much. But you see, some guys like uh, you see Wayne Newton lately. No, I haven't. Wayne Newton looks like a fucking alien. Uh, Steve Wynn, you know Steve Wynn, the big... Hey, well, from what? Plastic surgery? Plastic surgery like you wouldn't believe. You yeah. can barely recognize him. I mean, it's it's beyond... Uh, yeah, it's, you know, I guess it's because when a man does that and it's really visible, it makes you just think that they're really, really vain, you know, which is not not is not known always to be a masculine quality, right? I guess. I don't know. I don't know if that's the case, but there's uh, people where you just, and women, they just, their looks completely change. I can't believe we're actually discussing plastic surgery on We've this, gotten, listen, on our I, podcast. I'm sure a lot of people out there feel the same way. I went to bed, I was 32. I woke up, I was 63. Somewhere I lost 30-something years. I became an old man. People... Everyone will. People if, I mean, unless age. unless you die young, but everyone's going to become old. When I was younger, when right. I was younger, someone my age was an old man. Why? Well, right, but nowadays, how old are you? I'm 63. 63 is the new 43. Back uh, then, 63 was 63. Now, 63 is 43. They're, everything's different. I mean, they were grandpas. You know, you were. You know, I mean, got, you know, people got married way younger then, and all that. I'm just saying, you know. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's different. You still got a long way to go. You're still a young man. No, no, I'm not a young man. I'm going to be 55, man. I'm, uh, it's, it's, you know, yeah, I'm up I'm there. a senior citizen. I actually, before the pandemic, I actually one time, the first and only time I got $2 off going to the movies. I got the senior citizen discount. 
Well, now you've given me something to look forward to, Steve. <laughs> there you go. It makes it all worth it. I think yeah. I'm going to look this over. I'm going to maybe talk to someone. Look, maybe a little Botox. I got these fucking cracks in my head. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. It'd be gorgeous, Steve. One day, we're going to take a couple of week break. You may not even recognize me. You're going to go, who the fuck is that? That'll be when I replace you with somebody else. <laughs> I'm going to say, who the fuck is that? Who is who this guy? Who the fuck is that? Um... Listen, we're beginning the second half. This is the back nine of Talking Sopranos now. We're beginning the second half. And uh, it's so far, I have to say, it's really exceeded my expectations. Um, you know, it, the, in it, the enjoyment of looking back on the show, because I didn't for so many years, as, as uh, same, same with you, you didn't either. But also the, like, um, the participation of the cast and crew who have come on you know, with such good spirits and intentions, oh, yeah. and, and have made it really a pleasure. I mean, we, we our first guest, who I just saw uh, last week, uh, Mike Raspoli. We've had the the two soprano kids, Robert Eiler, Jamie Lynn Sigler, our casting people, Georgian and Sheila, Edie Falco, Lorraine Bracco, Terry Winner, Alan Coulter, Johnny V, John Ventimiglia, David Proval, Vinnie Pastor. I mean, uh, it's been. It's, it's, uh, yeah. And like you said, you know, uh, I'm enjoying it so much more now. I, I don't know why. Maybe not the, the pressure. I was always worried getting killed off, not getting killed off, all the, all the bullshit stuff. But now I watch every single actor on this show was fantastic. And I, the, yeah. the performances, and you even forgot how good they were. You know, like, you know, you say, what? You know, like uh, uh, Furio, Federico. He was terrific. Whenever he yeah. comes on screen, I get scared. David Proval uh, was just great. Kathy Narducci as Charmaine. Uh, terrific. Just Annabelle Shura, one of the you know great roles on the series. Well, uh, got Steve absolutely. Buscemi. Um, Aida Totoro. Yeah. Janice. Janice was the villain. In every episode, every season, you know, they said like, you know, uh, Richie Aprile was the villain, uh, Ralphie, Tony Blondetto, uh, Frank Vincent character, Janice, from when she hit the, the screen till the end, she was the villain. Yeah. You never know what she's going to do. You never know what she's going to do. Uh, you know, we had Robin Green, Mitchell Burgess, uh, Ariel, Ariel uh, Kylie, Tracy, Martin Bruce Lee told us about the music. We had Max Casella, Phil Abraham, the DP, uh, uh, David Chase. Who else has David Chase, man? And a very well, candid, great interview, too. You was, know, Federico, you know. Federico Castelluccio was great. Jerry Adler, Hesh, 91 years old. Matt Price, uh, uh, the sound man, was there from day one. Ray Abruzzo. I mean, we've had everyone. And, and they we got a lot of great ones coming up. And everyone came with, you know, uh, like you said, they were happy to be there. You know what I like? The They're all watching and listening to the show. And I like that. And they're enjoying it because they would be honest with us. Yeah. You know? I mean, this is the definitive Soprano podcast for sure. You know, uh, we just had Lola, who was great. Matt Savito was great. Director Peter Bogdanovich. Frankie Valley. Legend, a goddamn legend. Uh, Matt Del Negro, Jack Bender, great director. Angel, they're all they're all be coming on in the second half of our, you know. Masaglia coming, Arthur Nascarella, Matt Weiner, Dan Grimaldi, uh, Willie DeMeo's coming on. Ala Kliuka, Ala Kliuka, who played Svetlana. It's one who, of my favorite characters. And mine too. And who Edie Falco was asked fairly recent who her favorite character was. And she and said, she Svetlana. said Svetlana, right? Uh, these, these people are all be coming on in the next uh, weeks and months. Uh, Chris Caldavino, who played uh, Billy Leotardo. Carl Capitordo played Little Carmine. Will Janowitz, my dear friend, who played Finn DiTrolio. Marianne Leone, who played my mom. 
Uh, Bobby Fanero, who played Eugene Pontecorvo. Maureen Van Zant is coming on. Great. Gabriella she Dante. did a great job on the show. 28 episodes. Look at Will Jenowitz. And I always knew he was a great actor. And I'm watching it again. The guy's terrific, man. Very underrated, understated role. Finn. Great, yeah, man. Really great Good role. stuff. And we got a lot more surprises coming. Yes, we do. Uh, yes, a we lot do. more people. We got a long way to go, my friend. Uh, so there you have it. Very good. I hope you know, we get there. I, I, I hope I don't die before <laughs> this is over. But if I do, you know what you have to do. Steve Sharippa motherfucks the world. The list is growing. I'm trying to slow it down. Uh, the list is growing, really. Growing. I would think the list would get smaller. Now you're I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you a tiny little. The Preview? top of my list, the very tippy top. Oh, I know who it is. Bill De Blasio. Really? Little sneak peek. Little sneak. Do you know him? I do not fucking know him. I don't want to know him. But what? What are you making a face for? I don't know. You don't know him, so face. what do you know? You don't know like his policies, it, his policies. I don't like his policies? What do you mean? I don't like what he's done to this city. It has nothing to do with politics. This is common sense. Policies, I said, not politics. Okay, but this is common sense. Common sense. Yeah, but you know what? By the time you die, you know, he may have, you know, be off the radar. Who knows? You might not even be thinking about him. His, I hope so. He'll probably be out of office. Who but knows? I, but I, I hold it. You know me 20 some years. I hold a grudge. You know that. You hold a grudge. Yes, I hold do. a motherfucking grudge. I don't let it go. <laughs> I know people that have burned me in the fifth grade. I'm still fucking. But you got to let that stuff. That stuff's going to eat you alive. It's not There's good. a guy on my block. I was 10 years old. He fucking threw a snowball at me. Hit me in the eye. He's a motherfucker. He'll He's be on, on the, the list. list. Oh, yeah. You never made up with him. Fuck no. Hit me in my right eye. You think I'm going to let that go? How old were you? 10. 53 years ago, my friend. This winter, 53 years ago. This winter. Well, we'll see what happens. I don't know, I don't know what to say. <laughs> you seem speechless. You know, Lola brought up uh, that you were stand up. Oh, Jesus Christ. You know, we're going to have to edit that out. Uh, no, yeah. we're not editing shit out. <laughs> I'm never going to hear the end of it now. We're not editing. I'll okay. never hear the end. Well, you think I she called her? I was shy. She didn't stand offish. I wasn't stand off. Do you think I called her and said, say, hey, hey, hey. I, I don't doubt it now. I never even spoke to the girl before in my you've life. Been, you've been campaigning to get somebody in your camp. I she know said I, I waved to her. Ah. Ah. You went like this. Yeah. Ah. I gave it a high. <laughs> Just like that. She was probably like, Steve, how you went? Yeah. No way. <laughs> <laughs> she all was right. probably all excited to see you. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, here we are. Uh, Pi oh my. The original air date was October 13th, 2002. Uh, it was directed by uh, Henry Bronstein, who we've had on our show. This is the fourth episode of... Four that he directed. Uh, it was written by Robin Green and Mitchell Burgess. Number 11 of 17 episodes. Yeah, and the Piomai is the name of the horse that Ralph buys off of Hesh. Uh, is also the Crazy Horse, which is the name of the club. A lot of the uh, scenes that take place in the club. Horse is also another name for heroin, which Christopher winds up using. Later on, and then we have a song about a horse at the uh, end of the episode. And uh, Piomai is played by Goldie. I, I I don't know if they call her Goldie anymore. I think they just call her. I think she's just Piomai now. No. Oh really? They changed. Apparently, her? apparently she's still alive. I mean, that's that that this. How old is this horse now? Probably back then she was maybe three years old. That's that's like nineteen years ago. 20 you're allowed, years ago. You're allowed to do that? Change your names? Uh, maybe it's a nickname, but the horse must be like 20-something years. Unless they're trotting out the son or the daughter. I don't know. Who would oh. know? You think they're fake? It's imposters. I don't know. You think that's, how, that's a pie how, my imposter. How old do horses get? Andy, can you 
check that what out. How old do horses live till? I mean, I don't know. Andy told us racehorses do. They live from 25 to 30 years. So Pio Meyer, Goldie, is still around, I guess. Um, you know, we <laughs> tried to book uh, Pio Meyer, Goldie, for the podcast, but apparently she hates the podcast. She really? Just can't stand it. Yeah. Really? She listened a few times and refused to come on. She said, no, it's beneath me, and I'm not into it. Uh, I understand. But you know there what? You Maybe you fucking high had it her, too. No, I love horses. You love horses. It's it's people you have a problem with. Horses are no problem. <laughs> Hi, oh my. All right. <laughs> uh, we open up. We're at the Crazy Horse. Band is playing. Adrian is at the bar. Tony, uh, Tony and Silvio arrive. Uh, Tony picks up the phone. It's She's not Tony. happy to see them. No, she's scared. Paranoid. You know, uh, she's worried that they're going to find out. Uh, she, Tony's on the phone, and she's hearing, uh, what, an FBI informant? I'm going to fuck her face up before I kill her. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you got to understand, for her, it's her life is really just, it's been destroyed. I mean, everything has kind of just fallen apart. The, the stress that she must be under at this point in her life must be, you know, unimaginable. But what do you think? How should she have handled this? Just, I mean, I'm being dead serious here. I mean, I mean, should she immediately have gone to Christopher? No, she should have first gotten a lawyer. You don't think that she should have just said, hey, they fucking pulled me up. They're trying to get me to talk. I'm not going to, I'm out of here. I'm going to California now. Ba, ba, ba. You don't think something like that should have happened? Maybe. She came. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I that know she was afraid, but maybe she should have, you know, let's go see Tony. The two of us, they got me. I didn't say anything. They're threatening me. He could have well, got I mean, she's scared. I mean, they've thrown, you know, they've thrown at her that she can go to jail for dealing coke. That's the big trump card, you know. Yeah, you know, they should have talked to Neil Mink, Tony's attorney. Yeah. You know. But uh, it's just, there's no, it's really kind of a no-win situation. I mean, yeah, she's, and, uh Yeah. I mean, she's really suffering. It's a, it's, it's an, it's between a rock and a hard place, you know. It's a, and the FBI does this. This happens all the time. That's how they do it. That's how they do it. You know. I mean, you go, you know, you want to get the big fish, and you're not going to get, you're going to get the big fish by getting the smaller fish first, right? It's very scary. That's how they do it. Very they scary. want Tony Soprano. Yeah. They want Tony Soprano more than they want Christopher or more than they want Paulie Walnuts or whatever. They want Tony Soprano. That's, you know, you cut off the, you know, fish at the head. Whatever. And, and uh, do we know, uh, does she know that Christopher's killed people? Does she know that? I don't know. Um, I, don't, I don't think they would talk about those things. No, I, I mean, sure hope can not. assume it. I mean, you know, there's a scene later on where this stuff kind of, you know, her eyes are really open to it. I mean, and she also probably chooses to... Listen, she grew up around the mob. We know that, you know. Yeah. She's she's uh she was Richie and Jackie's niece. Yeah. She's Jackie April's niece. So she's grown up around it. She kind of assumes it, but she probably thinks, well, these guys are you know, if someone winds up getting killed, they probably, you know, deserved it. Deserved it went against the family. Well, she's a gun mall. She's a gun mall type. And if she wasn't with Christopher, she would be with another wife. She was raised in that world, 100%. She, she's not dating a, a mailman or nothing. You know what I mean? She's uh, she's uh, in that world. Adriana walks outside. Uh, oh, the band playing there is called No Soap Radio, which I think they just gave the, that name. It's not a real band, but it's formed by a bunch of musicians, one of whom, uh, Danny Rizal, was in a band called The Crash, the Crash Moderns. Um, no Soap Radio, do you know what that is? No. It's kind of a practical joke. Uh, it started in the 50s. It's like a punchline uh, that doesn't make sense. So I would say a joke like, hey, two polar bears are sitting in the bathtub. One says, pass the soap. The other one says, no soap, radio. So the punchline. <laughs> and then everybody laughs, and it kind of, it, it, it's, a, it's an exercise in mob mentality. So you'd see, you'd see if that person would go along and laugh at something they don't uh, understand or not. And it stayed in kind of popular culture f since the 50s. And pe it was actually a, in 1982 on ABC, a sketch comedy show with Steve Gutenberg. Oh, really? uh, that didn't last very long, called No Soap Radio. But uh, 
I think that happens very much. Aren't people afraid uh, of saying, like, look, people are afraid to say they don't like The Sopranos. People in circles. People are afraid to to, to be different, yeah, to stand out. They go, you know what? I know everyone says it's genius, blah, blah, blah. I don't care for it. Right. You know, there are people that will just go along, yeah, yeah, it's great, even though they don't think so. Exactly. No, I know. Like you're afraid to admit you love soap operas. You never, you know, you don't tell I, most people that. I don't dislike them. I used to watch The Young and Restless for many years. But some people would be afraid to say that. You're I, secure. You're not insecure. I'm very secure. Uh, you know what? You know what I'm not crazy about? I'm going to take a lot of heat from this. I'm not saying it's a bad show. It's extremely well acted. Okay? I watched a bunch, uh, not all of them, Breaking Bad's. People compare it to The Sopranos. I don't see it at all. Maybe it's the subject matter, the the drugs, the methamphetamine. I don't know. I don't think it even compares. That's all I'm saying. I've never think, seen it. I think Brian Cranston is fantastic. And a gun is uh, the, uh, the other guy, Paul. I'm just saying, Aaron Paul, I'm just saying the show itself, eh, it's okay. I haven't seen it, I'll be honest with you. Yeah. But a lot of people don't like Seinfeld. I've never seen Friends either. Oh, that's a good show. Never seen a friend never seen a Friends episode. That's good. I've never seen Game of Thrones, like I said. I haven't I've seen never a lot seen of that. I haven't seen a lot of You can't see everything. Yeah, but you don't see much of anything. No, I see what I need to see. Yeah. You know. But a lot of people won't see that they don't like it or Friends, are you crazy? You never saw Friends? Never seen it, no. Yeah. What's his name's a little douchey, Matthew Perry. I worked with I worked with David Schwimmer. Courtney Cox is great. I know her. Uh, uh Jennifer Anderson, Matt LeBlanc, great. Uh, I've met Matt, Matt LeBlanc. We yeah. done we did a photo shoot together. And Matt's a good guy. Yeah, I did their show when Petraea was on it. Matthew Perry's a douchebag of that group. Just really? so you know. Yeah. I didn't know that. He's a douchebag of that group. In case you were wondering. Yeah. All right. If you go home at night and you 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 you're getting something to eat, you go. I wonder which one of these friends is a douchebag. Now you know. It's Matthew Perry. All right. All right. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Adriana walks outside, looks through the window. She's seeing Christopher, Silvio, Fiorio, and Tony beating the man up, Giovanni. Giovanni, yes, he's getting beat up for whatever the hell reason he did. See, oh, uh, it's, I'm sure it's about money. <laughs> uh, and they're, uh, she's scared. Uh, they're beating him up with a phone book. That seems to be... Uh, doesn't uh, leave bruises, apparently. It doesn't leave bruises, really? Yeah. Is that what that's about? Well, uh, usually you do it on the body. Yeah, it's not... if you When you punch on to the body, it'll leave bruises. Uh, the the uh, phone book to the body leaves less of a mark. That's why gotcha. they do it. Yeah. Uh, we got Janice's house. Janice. Uh, I think she's watching Jerry Springer, if I'm not mistaken. Really? As he said, and you hear him say, let's bring out your lover. And he, she's looking at, uh, which is something I think Janice would watch, right? Yeah, or Maury Povich. One of, the, one of those. Right? Maybe it was Maury. Uh, they're competing for Bobby here. We got JoJo. Is JoJo, do you think, competing? You know, making a play for Bobby or just being nice like no, the other? No, I think she's making a little play. He's lonely. You know, she's they, a gun I've, mall. She I've, wants to be. Yeah, I've said it before. They, these are gun malls. They they go for that, you know. And Bobby, it's their even, world, yeah. Even though Bobby's overweight, uh, as we've said, uh, they say TV puts 10 pounds on you. I say it takes 50 off you. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. You know what I'm saying. All right. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> Janice, Janice looks. Janice's name look, is an aphrodisiac. Uh, J- there say. you go. J- uh, Janice looks through <clears throat> binoculars and sees uh, JoJo bringing food over to Bobby's. All right. Uh, Adriana, the nail salon. <laughs> I mean, she's looking with binoculars. I mean, she's. I, I mean, she's out of her skull. She's got, she's she's got just, a whole setup. She's this is all planned. It's all planned out. She is manipulative as can be. We've seen it. She's gone through Richie, who she murdered. 
Ralphie should kick down the stairs. Turk, uh, Aaron Arkaway, who Turk uh, Pipkin kind of kind of didn't work out. She had that, that young kid that she was nineteen year old kid up in Seattle or something. Yeah, that's the guy. She could, he could go all night long. That was her fiance for a <laughs> while, right? And now uh, her therapist. She says, you know, she sees Bobby in need and. Uh, Michelle Sa- Sam Pietra is really good. I thought. Yeah, she's good. I like her, what she does with this. Character. I haven't seen her in a long time. She's great. Yeah. Uh, Adriana's getting her hair done. Uh, her mother's on one line on the cell. That's David Pitu playing the uh, stylist. He's a two time Emmy nominee, by the way. Did the front page with your buddy Nathan Lane. He's, he's uh, you know done a lot of work in theater, on Broadway, and TV, and movies as well. Um, he says, I have a boliage at 11, which is just kind what of... What is that? It's when you paint the color on, right onto the hair. Instead of just dyeing it, you actually paint the color into the hair. Oh, I guess okay. it's a it's a labor-intensive and time-consuming process. Uh, but they're watching the beauty shop, the FBI agents. They're following her around, man. It's, uh, and she's scared, as she should be. They want to see her in East Hanover. She says, I'm going to get a wax and a... Uh, I guess a color. They said, "Well, wait. That takes a long time." They're gonna wait. Yeah, they're all they're all in. This is this is this is a big get for them having her as a you know a CI, a confidential informant, right? It's a big deal. At Bobby's house, he's outside saying goodbye to Silvio and Christopher. They came to visit him. Uh, Janice rings a bell. Jojo's in there. She made chicken marsala. Do you like chicken marsala? It's okay. Made with marsala wine, usually with mushrooms as well, yeah. right? Yeah, it's the darker one. I like yeah. uh, I like the other one with the lemon. What is that? Chicken? Yeah, franchise. Uh, franchise. I like that better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, she gives instructions uh, when to heat it up. Uh, if you have egg noodles, put it on there. Bobby's very down and depressed. Hasn't she? You're very good in this scene. You know, yeah. you, you, it's there's a. A honest vibe to to what you're bringing, you know, to this character at this point. Yeah, he's unshaven, which you never saw before. No, he's 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 a wreck. You know, he's depressed. No, he's very uh, depressed. You 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 play it really honestly, and I you. have to say, it's very good work. She wants to uh, uh, she wants to pick Janice. Says she'll pick the kids up at school. She starts cleaning the dishes. Uh, Janice starts talking planned. about the kid, jo, uh, JoJo's kid, Michael Jr., who's on Riddle. You know, she's just throwing her, you know, I mean, throwing mud at her so she looks bad in Bacala's eyes. She's really making a play here. And she, then that moment, she stares her down, too. Yeah. And, and, and JoJo. like, get the fuck out of here, basically. JoJo decides to leave. Yeah. Uh, Janice comforts Bobby. He's crying. She starts rubbing him, uh, touching him. Uh, there's a uh, Janice is just all in. She's planned this out. This isn't just happening by accident. Oh no, she's she's planned this like several steps in advance. Like she's like a grandmaster chess grandmaster or something. Uh, you know, and she goes into the freezer. She's looking at the different foods. You got and Gabriella's shells and the lasagna Carmela made. I I guess Carmela made that. Uh, she pulls out the ziti. Bobby's horrified. That's Karen's last ziti that she made before she died. And that Bobby falls apart. I loved her so much. You know, it's funny, the, the food theme here. Here's Bobby. You know, fat guy, loves to eat, obviously. Uh, and it's the food is a big deal here. You know what I mean? Uh, they all, all the family, they brought the family food and... Karen's Lazidi. It's in the freezer, and I guess he's just not ready. He's waiting for the right time for that. But she's trying. Janice she is- wants she wants you to move on she to wants. her. And it just happened. It's very new still. I mean, I don't know. A week, two weeks. It's very new. That very they're still they're still bringing food, which means it's yeah. the, the first week or two, right? We're in the bakery. Adriana arrives. You got uh, Agent Harris, Chicarone, and uh, San Severino. Uh, Played by Karen Young. Yeah, uh, she was. She's done a lot of work as well in the, in in film and TV. She also was in the original production of A Lie 
of the Mind, which is a, one, a great play by Sam Shepard, and he wrote and directed. He directed that original production as well as wrote it, and she was in that. She, she also did the revival with Ethan Hawke. She played a different character. I think that was like 2010, but she's she's, she's very, very good. good. It's a great scene, I think. I mean, a lot happens in this scene, and, and uh, Matt and Lola and uh, Karen and, and, of course, Dre, fantastic in this scene. It's really good. Um, you know, uh, when Danielle tells her that I'm not going to be – you know, working with her, you're going to start working with Agent San Severino. Uh, Adriana feels bad. Why? You know, it's kind of that. Um, you remember Dog Day Afternoon, right? Mm -hmm. I've seen it. So Charles Durning is the main guy in the beginning, right? He's the main cop trying to negotiate with Al Pacino to let to get the the hostages safe and let him give up. And at some point, they bring in. Uh, it's Matthew Broderick's father, right? Was his name James Broderick, I believe. Uh -huh. He's kind of a, maybe he's FBI or he's a higher up in the police force. But Durning's like an everyman, kind of like, you know, kind of a nice guy. Good, you know, he's playing the good cop, trying to be good. And then they kind of put him aside and they bring in this other guy who's much colder and much harder. And Pacino's like, where's so-and-so? Gotcha. I don't want to deal with you, you know, because he felt comfortable. And it's, it reminded me of that. I got you. I can't, but you know, she did, you know, I think uh, Adriana did also kind of feel bad. I think she considered this girl her friend, you know. Uh, she even she, she was off. intimate and, and revealed herself, revealed Absolutely. details about her personal life. You know, she to says, her. eat shit, Danielle, or whatever your name is. Uh, no. And, you know, she, they're saying, you don't even know where your boyfriend is half the time. Well, uh, they also open her eyes here. And, and this is a big thing. Uh, you know, he's like, Tony loves Chris. That would never happen because they say Christopher's in danger or whatever. Um, ultimately, we know what Tony does to Christopher later on. But he, but then they bring up Richie Aprile. And she's assuming he's in witness protection. And they bring up Pussy. And she's assuming they're, he's in witness protection. And, the, you know, they're telling the truth. They say, no, they're not in witness protection. We have absolutely no record of them. You figure it out. And she realizes these guys are probably dead. And yeah. they were probably killed by maybe Christopher or Tony Soprano. So, you know, she really wakes up in this scene. I think her denial is a little bit broken. And she realizes how, just how dangerous this world is. You know, she didn't want to, like you said, she didn't want to know. She just kind of assumed this is how it is. But now they're kind of saying these guys, because Pussy especially was beloved, right? He was... Like a brother, almost, to Tony. Of course, of course. I mean, as far as with Adriana and a lot of the, the mob women, they love this. They love this excitement, this lifestyle. We saw it in Goodfellas with Karen. She describes it. You know, great seats at the Copa. Everyone kissed his ass. Uh, you know, the guy's tipping all over the place. It's uh, the, uh, Christopher brings home gifts and jewelry and all this stuff he gets hot and they go to dinners and etc they et cetera. get they get special treatment everywhere they go of course you know, right? they stay in their circle though they got to stay in their world of course you know they go somewhere else it may not be that way so they stay in that world and the women love it just as much and there's a hierarchy within the mob women carmela's the godmother here. the queen yeah they kiss her ass we're in the Soprano kitchen. Carmella and Tony are talking. I think J uh, Jim Jimmy had a cold during this episode because he's you could in this scene and in the Crazy Horse scene, the first scene, his voice is hoarse. He seems a little, you know. I think yeah. He's when he goes the into weather. the refrigerator, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I noticed that too. Uh, and listen, Tony, I, want, I was talking to cousin Brian. Uh, I got a free tip on a medical stock. Uh, it's a ten thousand. You know, she says it like it's. $200. $10, no yeah. Deal, know. You know, uh, uh, well, we don't have that kind of money on hand right now. She says if you bought Dell in 1989 for 10000 it would be worth $5 million now. So that was like basically 11 years ago. Right. 89, this was shot in, you know, uh, what, 91, I guess. It, this like this was shot in 2001, probably. Carmelo's disappointed. No, Tony he says, says the bad economy, and the economy was, you know, after 9-11, everybody got, you know, was 
very uncertain as to what was going to happen, and he's using that as an excuse. Tony walks in the backyard. He gets money out of the birdseed container. Now, what's he getting the money for? Is that for the gambling in the in the track the next I day? Guess the track, that's what it looks like. Some yeah. pocket money. He's got plenty in there. He could have gave a 10000 with no problem and took a shot, but, you know, he said he's going to talk to Ginsburg, his accountant. Yeah about Brian, the things that he has proposed. We're at the stables, Tony Ruff, Silvio Hesch, Carlo, and Ginsburg. They're looking at the horses. Tony's enamored with Piomai. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a goat there, and the goat, you know, is kind of a satanic image in a way, which relates to Ralph, because we, we're talking about him. You know, goats have been... Sometimes they were sacrificed, or the image of Satan, goat, somehow the, had the goat hooves. Or, uh, the, it's definitely, I think, an allusion to Ralph. It's Ralph bought Piamai off of Hesh. Yes. And he says, I buy the horse, he starts losing. Uh, Lois, the trainer, says, I don't want to get into her, Herman. She ran the whole race ahead by two lengths, and then she just stopped in the back stretch. Uh, Ralph, tell that midget. Not to be shy with the whip. You know, he doesn't care. He could care less. You know, he's tell the jockey to be. Uh, he he told, doesn't give a shit about the horse. He just cares about that. what kind of money he makes. Um, Alan, the, the accountant's name is Alan Ginsberg, which obviously that's a nod to the famous great beat poet, Alan Ginsberg. Um, the actor playing him, Stuart J. Zully, uh, who was on Vice and Blue Bloods as well, he uh, wrote a book called. My life in Yankee Stadium, for, and he spent 40 years as a vendor, Yankee oh, Stadium. Wow. Really? And wrote a book about it, yeah. Uh, Lo uh, Lois Petit, who's the trainer, is played by Manon Halliburton. I think she does a great job. It's very, uh, she, you know, I believe that she knows a lot about horses, the way oh, yeah. she's talking I about it, the way she's handling the horse. Um, does, a, does a really great job here. Um, yeah, the horse... Uh, Piamai is known as a, a, a speed horse, front runner. Usually those horses, they come out, you know, in the front and they stay in the front. That's usually her style. It didn't work the last race for some reason. Tony's thinking maybe it'll be better if she comes from behind, holds something back, although that's not, you know, usually you don't want to mess with a horse's style. But Tony gives a suggestion. Uh, right, he right. Just, Which uh, they don't really take. They don't really take a suggestion. No. It happened kind of accidentally. He got boxed in, you know, coming out of the gate by bumped and that bumped and then boxed in. So he had to come from behind, which he did. Uh, Junior's house. Junior and Murph are in the kitchen. Janice arrives. She brings <laughs> over JoJo's chicken marsala and says it's hers. Correct. Hang and on, also, what? I love Junior saying, "Is that what you're wearing?" To to Mur you know it's all about because Murph is a reflection on Junior. He's bummed that Murph is gonna not be so dressed up for court. I mean it's the what 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 Junior's thinking about this whole thing is like you know <laughs> now Murph is uh like I've said before uh, Murph uh, that's the role Pat Cooper audition for all right you know uh, I think I've said that before and if and if uh, he would have got it. I would have worked with him in this episode. I would have worked wow. with my arch enemy, my nemesis, my Lex Luthor. I would have worked with fucking Pat Cooper. Your Newman. Yeah, yeah. He's like your Newman to your... Uh, I don't know. I might have had a call in sick that day. Might have had a call in sick. Really? You would have went took it that far? Well, no. No, I would never quit The Sopranos. But I did. I was offered $20,000 for doing an appearance at Italian Festival down in Fort Lauderdale by our friend, uh, Sal. And uh, he told me it was going to be me and Pat Cooper, and I said, I'm going to take a pass. $20,000 was not enough. $20,000. What, what if it was 100000 I don't know. Then maybe I... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> and it's not because I had so much money and I couldn't use it. It wasn't that. Just that I didn't want to subject myself to being the same... Room is this motherfucker. Wow. So that says a lot. It says it says a lot I mean, of twenty see, grand's a lot of money for an appearance. That's, right. that's a lot of money. It says I'm stupid or it says I have uh scruples or I'm an idiot. One or the other, but or, 
I couldn't stand <laughs> the thought of looking him in the fucking eye. You have principles, I, talk I guess. Him. I don't know if I do. Maybe I'm just a moron. <laughs> Whatever it was. <laughs> this was about Somehow, the, So, I, I mean, it's... I don't know. Will this he is, be making an appearance in that video? No. He doesn't need to. You've already oh, spoken. Oh, that's... He's fucking... <laughs> Of course. 15 years ago, I mean, I could have certainly used the money, but he, I, I honestly could not stand to be in his uh, company. Uh, Junior to Murph. Uh, I can use that as in the trailer for the video, what you just did. Andy, make sure we get that as a clip. We'll put that in the trailer. Uh yeah, See, you know, it's it's uh, Junior's looking for change for the parking. I mean, what he where his head is at. I mean, it's just... and he takes it out of uh, he takes it out of Murph's coat. Murph. Uh, Janice uh, says to Junior, uh, you know, I've been helping Bobby. Uh, he's going to get through this. When I'm waiting like patience on a monument. Terrific it's just from line. Shakespeare. Yeah, it's actually. Uh, he said, "Bobby needs help." He, he goes, "He needs help." I'm on trial for my life. You know, it's he just. You know, you're like you said. It's not that long since your wife no, died. No, no, no. He steals. Uh, uh, Junior doesn't care for Janice and her bullshit. He doesn't like her. He said that seasons ago when she was a kid, she was no good. She stole ten dollars from him. He's very suspicious. She's, well, and then she says that Daddy said someday Bobby would be your linchpin, and he's like, Bobby was a head waiter when my brother Johnny died. Exactly. He knows that she's she's, she's working Junior with the bullshit. Uh, uh, what's he say? Each of us is alone in the universe. Yeah, each of us is alone. That's kind of a common. I mean, Livia, that's all a big nothing. You know, there's a lot of that in the Soprano family. What, you know, um, she also says Bobby was home. Yeah, he's like offended. Bobby was home. Like yeah. somehow you were goofing off. You know, you're, you're mourning to, your wife, your kids. Your kids are now it lost a mother. He doesn't give a shit. Well, he doesn't understand what that's about. He has no kids. He doesn't have a wife. You know, he doesn't. I understand. mean, you can imagine. No, I mean, what, come on. It's all about him. It's just the way, same way it's all about Tony Soprano. Uh, Junior tells her Bobby was supposed to do something for me. Bobby didn't do it. Junior's not happy about that. We're at the racetrack, which is Aqueduct Racetrack, by the way. Oh, is it? Yeah. So, but the some of it was which ones were at Mon Monmouth? I thought it was at Monmouth. Uh, I believe this was in Aqueduct, but maybe uh, half and half. I well, because it was on the screen. Are you? No. No, not because it was on the screen, because I I read it, and I believe Arthur Nascarella told me they did it out in Aqueduct. Yeah, they did Arthur, something at Monmouth, though. This this episode? I don't know if it was this one. Uh, I remember them going down there, you know, to do something. that uh, might have been another I one. I believe so. It's Aqueduct Raceway in Queens. Okay. Well, we got the whole Ginsburg trying to sell Tony the, uh, you know, recommending the life insurance trust. That's a big red flag. Because it can't be altered. If something divorce comes up, you know it's irre ir ir irrevocable. And Tony does not like to hear that because he realizes that's a possibility. Is that how you pronounce that? I always say irrevocable. I'm not sure. Maybe both. Irrevocable. What does he say? Ginsburg says irre irrevocable, right? Yes, he does. Yeah. Uh, I'm just saying. Obviously, I've been saying it wrong forever. So he recommends in uh, Intervivo, which is a living trust, which is better. You can you can adapt it more to your situations. Uh, Tony likes that idea. That makes sense to him. The race goes off uh, eight to one. The horse so goes off won, at eight to one. He bet five grand, so he wins what twenty grand? Forty thousand. Forty thousand. Yeah, it's a lot of oh, money. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know when your horse. I, I mean, I've said this before. When the ho your horse wins a race, man. I mean, when we went up to Saratoga for Carmenucci's first race, that was Tony Sirico and Joe Scarp's horse. That was his first race, the maiden race they call it. It's your first race. Saratoga, which is you know a temple to horse racing. It's just a great. It's only during the summer. It's a great experience if you've never been upstate New York. When that horse pulled in front down the stretch, it was like your kid, you know, playing in the World Series or something. I mean, I, I, I wasn't an owner of the horse, and I was never so excited. And we all went down the winner's circle like what happens here. I still have the photo. I got to find that of us in the winner's circle. Did you, uh, did you guys drive down together, all of you? We flew on, a, flew private on a private jet. private plane? 
We did, and then we had dinner at Ciro's, which that's what you do at Saratoga. Saratoga has been described by my good friend Jerry Brown, who's a great handicapper uh, and, and writer about horse racing. Saratoga is like Gone with the Gone with the Wind meets Goodfellas. You have this old money, Kentucky money, and you know, up, you know, New York money, you know, horse money, uh, that old world thing, and then you have wise guys and you know, kind of bookies, uh, horse people from from the city, and it's this very, it's very unique. Ciro's is the restaurant that everybody goes to, and because horse racing, the the races are done by about five o'clock. Right, they start around noon. By five, they're all done. So you go out to dinner and you go to Ciro's. That's the scene. It's a great restaurant. Very and, expensive uh, place, right? And aren't they only open uh, for the racing season? Right? They're not open for the open. summer. Well, you know, Saratoga has a lot of people up in the summer. You know, just spending. But the racing season is in the summer. It's only, I think, mostly in August. There's some big races there. But uh, what happened was. They saw me and Sirico at Saratoga, and they heard that we had this horse, or he had this horse, Carmen Uch, which he named after his brother Carmine. Mm -hmm. From the scene in The Godfather where uh, I think Clemenza says Tom Uch, talking to Tom Hayden. I think Tony thought he said Carmen Uch, which he didn't say. He said Tom Uch, but... But everyone see, knew, knows that we have a horse, so they started betting on him, which was horrible, because the odds go down. Gotcha. Right? The more people bet on the horse, the odds will go down, you know, the day of the race or lead right, right up until the race starts. You know, as money comes in, the odds change. So they saw us and kind of, I don't know, because we were on The Sopranos, they figured, oh, I'll give it a shot. I'll bet on their horse. And the odds went down, but the horse won. And it was just exciting. Yeah. It's a good thing you didn't drive down with Tony. You know what it's like being in a car. It's a long ride to Saratoga. It's like three hours from the yeah, city. Yeah, I've, I've been up there. But well, you got the hairspray and the cologne. and The, the cologne knock. and the hairspray. And you're not Smoking. Allowed. Back then we were smoking. You, know? you can't open the window. You can't open the window because his hair is going to get messed and up. Then, uh, and then you can't put the air on because he's always cold. So you're just fucked. You you're drive trapped. with him, you are fucked. You're trapped. And uh, also Terry Winner calls the race is the race announcer in both these scenes you know that right oh no i did not know yeah that. that's terry oh really yeah terry winner are you know great oh writer. i've got to, i've got to go back to that I yeah it's terry that. totally oh that is fantastic so, all right we're at the winner's circle uh inez munez takes the picture she looks nervous who is she uh, that's her name on the racing license. She's Ralphie's maid. Right. So if you okay. have a if you have a uh, a record like a co felony conviction, you can't own a horse. You have you have because there's it's the gambling is involved and all that stuff. So you have to have some clean record. So I get, I'm assuming that's why Ralph or he just didn't want to draw attention to himself or some tax thing. I don't know. But uh, maybe she's a little bit older. She gets a tax break or something. I don't know. Probably because he has a record. Uh, you know, a Ralphie pours a bottle of Cristal. There's champagne all around. She's she's nervous and embarrassed, Inez. Obviously, completely out of an element here. Uh, and uh, Silvio is, is touting Tony. This man he knew. Right is right, Anthony. I'm giving you a taste. She ran your race. He gives, uh, Ralph gives Tony a nice wad of cash. Wow, how much? Three, Seven four grand? thousand, I would say. 10%. I would say like that. The jockey comes up. That is Aaron Grider, who is, uh, I think, just retired a couple of months ago, maybe like at the end of the season this year. Aaron Grider, over 4,000 career wins as a jockey, mostly New York and uh, I think Florida as well. He's done huge races, over $100 million in total purse earnings in his career. And a really good guy. I know Aaron, and he's uh, he's – Top of his field. This guy. And, and Lois says it was a fluke. Yeah, he got bumped out of the gate. Let me ask you something. How uh, how fixed is horse racing, or is it fixed? I know the trot is. Uh, when I was younger, I used, to yeah. go, I used to go to Yonkers Raceway when I was young, a yeah, teenager, 17, 18, 19. And those were very fixed. The yeah, racing. you know, I mean, listen, there's a lot of sometimes they get violations for doping. You know, there's certain drugs that are illegal that that that, uh, you know, performance drugs they give to horses like but uh, some are legal and some are not. 
you know, as far as fixed, you know, holding back. Yeah. You know, it's the kind of I, thing that. I don't that's, know. I'm asking. I don't know. That kind of thing is, listen, because it's in plain sight. So, I mean, if you're holding a horse back and, you know, there's certain expectations, there's, I think there's probably possibility. But the thing is, if you get caught doing that, you're screwed. Yeah. You know, is it worth it? You're talking about a business that these people have reputation, you know, someone like Aaron Greider or, or a trainer who does big horses. Uh, Carmen Uch was trained uh, by Todd Pletcher, one of the great, you know, Tony Sirico's horse was trained by one of the greatest uh, trainers there is. You know what I mean? So someone like that, you're going to risk your career by to win one race or something like that. You know, it's... Yeah. You know, I, I don't uh, think there's that much of it. And now, it, did it, you go to Yonkers? Did you go to Yonkers? Well, your... I lived five yeah, minutes away right from there. it. Sure, but as a kid. Yeah. The harness races were fixed. I, I don't know. Again, I, I mean, are they? Maybe. I mean, uh, uh, it's a different type of racing. I, it's not as exciting to me as thoroughbreds. Thoroughbreds is really... What about dogs? Racing. You like the dog race? I've never been to a dog race. Have you? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in Vegas... I, well, I've been in Florida... Uh, I've gone to the races in Florida. I also, Vegas for a very short time on the outskirts of town had a dog track that failed within a year or so. Failed miserably. A big horse track they built. Uh, it's pretty incredible. and it. Why? Because of the heat? And what, what I, I think maybe the heat and I think people just, the casinos. Because it's an outdoor activity and you have to be in the heat. We used to go. And uh, uh, we even talked about maybe buying one back then. I think it was Greyhound was like thirty five hundred dollars or something. But uh, yeah, it failed miserably. Maybe even I don't even know if it lasted a year. It was all the way out in Henderson on the way to Lake Mead. Yeah. You know? Huh. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, the Soprano Kitchen. Uh, the next scene after Ralphie gives uh, Tony the cash. The next scene, Tony's. Shelling out hundreds, he gives Carmela six hundred in cash, plus a hundred and fifty for new cleats, which are quite a bit of money for a high school kid's cleats. That's Twenty years money. ago, yeah, eighteen years ago, they got a big nut, the Sopranos. Yeah, you know, you got those papers for me to sign. Oh, she's so happy, she's ecstatic. You will not regret this. This is the best thing for all of us. Uh, he says, "I'm not going to sign that one." About the trust. And she says, that's the one. That's the most important one. That's really what I want you to do. And he says, no, let's do an open trust, more flexible trust. She's upset. She's uh, very uh, uh, very impressive, she says. And then he, it's kind of weird. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Kind of weird that he would bring that up at that time, I thought. Trying to deflect. I guess, you know. Um. She's pissed. The most important she thing she said, she says, I gave you two out of three. She said, gave me? You gave me? You know. Uh, Christopher's apartment. Adriana's in bed under the covers. She puts a towel on her head. Uh, we got dinner. Tony and Carmela tonight. She claims she's sick. I mean, she may very well be. I mean, listen, the stress, the physical, the, the mental stress that she's going through certainly can influence you. I mean, it's just, I, I, you can't imagine what she's going through. No, of course, but I think it's more that Agent Harris said, bring us Tony Soprano, get in there. She and doesn't want to go there. She and doesn't she, want to go there and then be questioned what they say, what happened at dinner. Uh, now, they won't, they, they haven't, have they pressured her to wear a wire? They do it later on. Uh, later they, on. It doesn't seem they haven't, they have not done that yet. And maybe she's still refusing. Or you know, she doesn't want to give the FBI information. Uh, Chris says, come on, get dressed, have a few drinks. It'll kill the germs. You know, I did that once. You know, that old, uh, come on, you know, drink Grand Meunier. It'll knock the cold out. Or drink vitamin C. I drink 15 vodka and orange juices, you know. Did it work? It, 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 your resistance gets low, and you get even more sick. But it's that stupid mentality. Come on, you know, drink. All right, you know, the guys are all telling you, come on, I don't want to miss it. You got a bad cold. You got a worse cold when you wake up. Uh, and that's what he's saying. It'll kill the germs, you know. Uh, 
Janice serves dinner. Where Chris shoots up in his t toes. Uh, you know, he's bummed out. He, You know, he's not going to go to dinner. So instead of dinner, he decides to shoot up and says, nothing ever goes my way. Yeah. Which and he says, this is the another inner sanctum. Recurring thing. The inner sanctum. Which uh, is true. Which I'm is just true. just not a relative. You think Paulie and his grandmas get invited? This is dinner with the boss, the CEO of the company. Yeah, it's, it's a big deal. You know, it's important. So he goes, decides to get high. We're at Bobby's house. Janice serves dinner to Bobby, Bobby Jr. and Sophia. They're serving, she's serving Carmelo's lasagna. But she doesn't tell them that. She does not tell them that. Another great scene for you, Steve, I have to say. You know, you, you really played the grief and all that, the guilt. You know, you're guilty that it wasn't, you know, you and the car. You know, all that stuff is done really, really well yeah, and thanks. very real. I got to tell you something, you know. I don't like watching myself as you don't at all. And, uh, you know, that first season was painful, really painful for me. My first season on the show, I thought I was horrible. And I'm just lucky David must have saw something in me to keep me around because I thought it was just horrible. And I didn't have big stuff. I had little stuff, obviously enough to get me. And I worked very hard with an acting coach and, you know, you Obviously, the only way to get better is by doing more and having the confidence. But sometimes it's harder to do a scene when you have one line than it is to do a whole scene, I find. Yeah, yeah. You but know, I'm because... Saying, it was just, for me, I was inexperienced, and David must have saw something, you know, uh, reacting anyway. But it was painful. I, you know, as the time goes on, I feel I've got had gotten to be a much better actor. It was like... This season two, my first season was like acting classes. You know, it was like on-the-job training, you know what I mean? And then finally I was able to do something like this, you know. I saw my uncle today. What were you supposed to do? Union business. Junior's been good to me. I let him down. Then, told, and then he thinks again, oh, fuck him. He only thinks of himself, the selfish old fuck. And Janice is pushing She's manipulating him. like crazy, getting him. You know, all these years you put in, you'll be a nobody. You know, she's like, I don't care if I lose, live or die. Well, we lose that luxury when we have children. I wanted to put a shotgun in my mouth after her husband left, and I thought of Harpo, which is all just, you know. <laughs> all bullshit. Uh, yeah. She could care less. She rubs Bobby's shoulders. She touches his hand. Uh, it doesn't go unnoticed by him either. Uh, he's Bobby says every day is worse than the last Janice tomorrow you need to get up and do what needs to be done well wow. that was Bobby yeah she's uh, she's got you know like she planned this three days ago steps ago she's way you know the chess moves you know absolutely she is the master here you know she is the uh, master uh, Brian and they're at the stables. Brian and Tony uh, walk the pile of my stable. Ralph and Lois are there. Uh, been clocking her best fractions yet, Lois. That means that's talking about workouts. So in between races, they work out a horse, you know, and there's official workouts where they will time a horse doing a short amount of distance. And they'll publish those. They'll publish that in the racing form so you have an idea how this horse is looking. Uh, the workout's better, you know, and there's... There's ways of factoring that into if you think the you think that it's going to help the horse win or not. So she's been clocking her best fractions, which means she's on an ups. You know, horses go in cycles often. You know, based on their fitness and their experiences and 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 what's going on. And so she's clocking her best fractions. She's coming on an upswing. So it looks very good that she's going to be. But she's in rich company, meaning. It, he says, you wanted a stakes horse, this is a stakes race. Stakes race is a higher grade. So probably the first race was like a claiming race. This is a higher grade. These are horses who have already won probably their maiden race or won a couple of races. And there's more purse money, but it's higher competition. Stakes race is where the money is, right? So uh, it's a short race, like they say. So he wants to, uh, you know, let him, let Piamai go out in the front. Wire to wire means... She stays in front from beginning to end of the race. But only a really fast horse can do that. Ralph is a, a fucking jerk. He calls her senior. You know what yeah. I mean? It's just, he's just, uh, he always has some, 
shitty thing to say to He's people. He's a smart aleck. Now, I've yeah. been with you at the track, and you uh, really studied him. Uh, I uh, used to really be into I used to bet on horses a lot. Yeah, but uh, you really study the form, the racing form. Yeah, I mean, some people know much better than I do, but, yeah. I mean, I, you have to learn how to read a racing form because there's a lot yeah. of information on it, and it's complicated. Well, I mean, you but, didn't uh, just go by the name. Hey, uh, I like this guy's name. I'm going to bet him. No, but sometimes you may as well just do that because yeah. you can see something in the form and it's, you know, uh, you think you think you understand it. But, it, you know, so it, you're probably getting good odds on this horse because it's going up in class. So it has to prove itself in this class now. You know what I mean? It's uh, it, it's fun. I mean, I find it really interesting. I like going to the track. I don't do it as much as I used to, um, but I do. It's a... Uh, Thoroughbred racing is very, very exciting. It yeah. really is. Yeah, yeah. Well, Belmont, we, one of the great we, tracks. I, yeah, I went to, I went to the Belmont. Uh, Florida, we went. you got Gulfstream is fun. Your dad uh, was there. Yeah. I, you yeah. know where I went? I went down in New Orleans uh, where they had the the uh, night racing. At the Thoroughbred time. night racing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This was 1980. On my way to Vegas, we stopped in New Orleans, and uh, someone took us yeah. to it was at night, the flats, yeah. Churchill uh, is very exciting. Churchill Downs, that's con that's in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, where they have the Derby. That's uh, the last race I went. Santa Ana, they had wiener dog races, and I went. Oh, get out! I swear to God, I swear to you, we went. My dog didn't race. I wish they would have. They got wiener dog races. They do it once a year. And how how long did there's they... hundreds of wiener dogs there? It's a short race, no. Yeah, they don't go around the track. It's Do they like, go fast? Really fast. Wiener dogs are fast. Not like greyhounds. No, no. no. They're little. They got legs that look like chicken wings. Yeah. I've never dogs. heard of that. Do they have that little mechanical rabbit that, that they no. follow? Or no, No. the owners, you know, you got one owner on one side and a friend of the owner on the other, and then they let them go and you run to that thing. They run pretty I've far. never heard of that. And they have flags go... You know, go whatever the dog's name is. You know, I got to enter Willie. Willie would do well. Let's well, this is a six furlong. This is a sprint. You know, so it's for, uh, six eighth. I guess three quarters of a mile. I believe a furlong is an eighth of a mile, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, uh, Tony, Ralph, uh, the Brian, they watched the race, right? Uh, Brian, damn it! I bet the show. The horse wins again. Pie, oh my. Bet to show means you bet the horse to come in third. So if the horse comes in first, second, or third, you get paid. But you get paid much less than if you bet it to win or place. Tony uh, says, what's your win? Five bucks, my financial advisor. Uh, this is it. This is happiness. Winning is one thing, but when it's your horse, Anthony, once again, your horse wisdom is not going unappreciated. He holds out his hand. Ralph gives him a stack. Tony just keeps his hand out. Now, he must have won. Maybe Ralph won. He probably won a lot more money. Plus, he's getting the purse. Cut, uh, you know, uh, uh, the majority of the purse because he's the owner. Um, I got to tell you, right? I mean, Tony just like a real kind of little gavonish here. Just keeps the hand out, and Ralph just keeps on. I mean, he must have gave him 10 grand now, maybe more. 10 grand. Maybe he won 75. On the race, give him ten grand. Yeah, gave him uh, a lot of money. And Tony has no, no bones, no nothing. Three times, Ralphie put money in his hand. Right. You know, uh, Soprano Kitchen. Tony arrives. Flowers on the table. Carmela comes in from the garage. She's holding two six packs of like Diet Coke. Soda. I mean, she's, yeah. she's always working, Carmela. She's busy. Always, always busy. I see the flowers got here. I came into some cash. I sold the property. He's lying. Let's buy the stock. So if he's willing to pay ten for the stock, he must have got fifteen or twenty. He did. He did really good. Yeah. Plus uh, he probably bet on the horse. Carmela's pissed off. Uh, they missed the stock opportunity. The medical stock opportunity had already split. But you know, she's pissed. She Tony was goes, right. She could have made money. Goes in the refrigerator. Uh, he gets out the cold ham. He sits at the table. He's dunking it in the mustard. Uh, Dorley's Lounge, Bobby Parks outside. Now, we shot this at a real bar. I don't think it's called Dorley's. 
I don't know no. if that was a real name. I don't think so. But it's in Newark, and I I think I went to work at midnight. It was on a Friday night. You shot all night. Shot until 3, 3.30 in the morning, 4 o'clock. Uh, That's I mean, my buddy Santo Fazio playing Teddy Generetti, who's the uh, sh- is he the shop steward? Is that the deal in the uh, yeah. of the union? Santo's been uh, a lot of movies and TV, uh, but also a really good director. He directed a play called The Mayor's Limo that our friend Jim, Jim Hendricks was in, who was in Hungry Ghost, and, and Sharon Angela was in as well. Uh, he also was the owner of Three of Cups. Yeah, the bar Great restaurant place. in the East Village, uh, where John Ventimiglia was bartender at one point in the. But unfortunately, it closed uh, down. I think it was yeah. on good First it, Avenue. Really good Italian joint. I just yeah, worked. I just uh, worked with him last season on Blue Bloods. Blue Bloods. He's on Blue Bloods now. We yeah. had a scene together. We yeah. had a scene together. He did one episode. Uh, I remember doing the scene, and I did it every which way for Henry, every which way, faster, slower, softer, harder. Every which way. I mean, I, I did 20, 25 takes here. Really? Uh, I like how you say your name is Jim Blake. Jim Blake. You don't look like a Jim Blake. No. Although Santo reminds me of Robert Blake a little bit. Yeah, I guess he, he has kind of that vibe. You know, he always uh, did. Too. You know, he threatens, Bobby threatens him. Uh, he kind of threatens his family, too. You know, you oh, got yeah. a caravan out there. You got a family and... Uh, Says Dick Hoffman, he's out of touch. I'm sure you guys got your grievances. He's out of touch with reality. I'll put a bullet here, here, and here. Uh, you know, I did it every which way, and it was fine. But Henry always covered his bases. You was know, that he, the way you liked what best? The what's in the yeah, what, yeah, yeah. The I final it, cut. I thought it was a good scene. Yeah, I thought it came out. Not too much. Not you know threatening like that. Very simple. Come it's, in, order a drink. It's kind of more disturbing that way. Kind of order a drink. Bobby uh, downs the drink, throws, uh, you know, whatever, $10 bill on the bar. Uh, and when I said to Henry afterwards, when we finally wrapped, because we had to, uh, and I said, Henry, you got this, right? And he went, I hope so. And this is what, 5 in the morning? No, it's 3.30 in the morning. But, I mean, it was done. You know, the thing was... There's nothing else to do. There was nothing else to do. And yeah. That was done, and I guess... It's a, good, you know, it's a really good scene. I mean, Santo's a great actor. The the, uh, the song is Theme for imaginary for an Imaginary Western by Mountain. This is a Western theme again, which at the end of the episode, we'll see that uh, that theme come back. You know, he was very good. Very, very good. Uh, Santos and Henry, I always enjoyed working with. You know, uh, I always enjoyed working. We got along. Me too. Yep. We got along just fine, you know. Uh, and he had a tough job because he was uh, handling the crew and the budget and stuff like that. So, you know, didn't have an easy gig there. Uh, Christopher's apartment, Adriana, watches a commercial, Body by Jake. Now, that's Jake's, Jake Steinfeld, who's actually a friend of mine. He Is, uh, is he? He's, yeah, he started out as a trainer to the stars like for he was Spielberg's trainer and Harrison Ford wrote some books started doing these videos but in the early 90s maybe late 80s he had a sitcom called Big Brother Jake that was on the family channel which was I think kind of a Christian network. I remember that I and remember I was that. a guest on one of the episodes what did you play I played an act I think I played a I might have been a high school kid. I mean, I was like 22 or something, 23. Maybe even 24. Maybe I played a college kid. I don't remember. Who was doing a scene. I think he played a guy who uh, had a house with a lot of foster kids or something, if I'm not mistaken. or that was. I don't think it was an orphanage, but I think it was like a lot of kids, and he was running it. And I did a scene from Romeo and Juliet with the girl who lived there with him. We were doing the play in school, or maybe it was college or something, but it was in Virginia Beach, and I remember, and uh, I see him from time to time. He lives in L.A., and uh, he's he's a good dude, man. I Is like him. Is he a good guy? Well, yeah, he had, and we, he had, we had a lot of fun. Commercials, and then for he years. Went, and he, he did bit parts in movies. Oh, uh, yeah. A lot of movies. 
You know what? I want to say he was in Coming to America. He was. Cab driver. Yes, he was. Right? He's, done, he's done a lot of work as an actor. But, but this uh, was uh, so actually become... one of the first TV. It might have been the first TV thing I ever did. I'll be honest. Really? With you. Yeah. So I, I didn't he become like extremely wealthy from selling all the equipment? And oh, all yeah. Stuff? He did very well with, uh, ah. with uh, his. He had a whole. He had equipment like this is the bun and thigh rocker. There was the ab thing. He had then he had the videos, you know, and uh, I mean, he might have had equipment, you know, like clothes. And Did he send, you, he send you anything? I never asked for anything. Uh, so your career, your TV career, Emmy Award winner, you owe to fucking Jake. Jake Steinfeld. Yeah. Well, that's a ultimately. Salute. Yes. Salute. Be, yeah, it was uh He's a good dude, man. I see him. He he, act, he was involved in professional lacrosse at one point, uh, the league. He was one of the uh, people who started that league as well. But he's... Um, wow. Who would have known that? Smart guy. Entrepreneur. Yes. Uh, Adriana, you know, when, when Chris walks in, she's excited to see him, happy. Kisses him a little. Uh, Kisses him a lot. She's really happy to see him. Really happy to yes. see him. I guess she's happy what? That... He's alive. She's worried. She's scared really, now. She's Something's really going to happen to him. Really worried. Yeah. I think yeah. once, like, they got through to her when they told her, listen, pussy is not in witness protection. Yeah. Neither is Richie, your uncle Richie. They're gone. Yeah. Anything can happen in this world. And she, it's, I think it's really dawned on her. I got to tell you, I feel very bad for Adriana. Yeah. This. I feel bad for her. She's, yeah. she's, Stuck here, man, you know. And uh, Drea does a great job. Crazy Horse, Vito, Eugene, Ralph, and Patsy arrive. Vito, is Tony here? Uh, Vito orders Nachos Grande and a Diet Coke. What's a Nachos Grande? What is that? Uh, that's everything. It's jalapenos, like chips, chips, cheese, cheese jalapenos, uh, probably ground beef. Salsa. The whole. Sour cement, cream. Sour cream. Maybe some guacamole. I don't know what kind of shit with the you diet get coke. Bar with a diet coke. Uh. <laughs> uh, the song playing is "Love Song" by Snake River Conspiracy. Jason Slater, who was in Third Eyed Blind as the bass player, he was in this band. He actually passed away uh, in December 2020. Um, oh, that sucks. Yeah, just very recently, unfortunately. But that's their his, their song, Snake River Conspiracy, playing. Uh, love song in the bar. Vito says you should play some Skinner. Skinner. Adriana's got this whole alternative rock, indie rock thing going on that she's really trying to be faithful to, which is a good idea. And and Vito wants Skinner. Vito knows. Oh. They go in the office. You know they're using her. I mean, she, her office is not even hers. Basically, now Tony uses it. They use it. Ralphie uses it. Uh, mold. They talk. It smells like mold. And Vito's like, mold can kill you. <laughs> and, well, he's a construction guy, don't forget. Yeah. He knows construction. He sits on the chair and he falls. And they laugh hysterical at him. That's got to be a tough moment for Vito. He breaks the chair. I, I don't think Vito had problems with tough moments in this job. <laughs> no? He was well, we'll see that later on. Fearless uh, as an actor. Junior's house. Junior and Murph are there. Junior watches newscasts about his trial. Uh, he doesn't like the uh, the court artist. Not at all. What am I, fodder for cartoonists? And the cartoon looks a little like David Chase, I thought. It looks more like David than it does uh, Dominic. We got to ask if that uh, was done purposely. Uh, what the fuck? What kind of likeness is this? You know, Bobby, a little support in the courtroom would be nice. Or are you still hanging creep? Is that a term for what? Is it soaking over your wife? Is that hanging? Hanging crepe. I think it has something to do with. Um, uh, is it the black bunting they would use for funerals or something, or is it ha you hang it to block uh, I, out the sun when you're in mourning? I don't know. I guess it's something like that. Uh, you know, all that moping around. You got to get on with your life. Uh, it just happened, you know. And Bobby tells him I took care of that thing. Him in 184 won't be a problem. Junior's very happy now. Bobby's Junior's, back. He took care of business. He's happy, yeah. He's going to give you a weight. He, you give him a weight. He goes, bring me that uh, dumbbell. 
the Dumb Valley. <laughs> I say, Janet, Bobby says uh, she made lasagna the, other, lasagna the other night. Delicious. With sweet sausage along with the beef. Junior figures it out. Sweet sausage in little pieces and a layer of basil. Leaves underneath the cheese. That's Carmela's lasagna. He knows that Janice can't make a good lasagna. <laughs> he don't buy that for a minute. He says people run away from her cooking. <laughs> There's no way. Also, he, Ju Junior has National Geographics on his uh, coffee table. I see. And then and later it, on, in a later episode, he's watching nature shows with the prairie dogs and stuff like that. I guess he's, an, he's into animals. And the well, animals he, he's and, got uh, a lot of range because he watches soap operas. He... Watches all kinds. He watches uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, as we see. By accident. You know, yeah. uh, Junior has a sweater on. Looks like Mr. Rogers. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, and I got a rotten court. Uh, Adriana's office. Her and Christopher walk into the office. They were here until 1 o'clock. She's complaining. They don't pay for nothing. They got a $200 bar bill. Uh Ah, here we go. In the olden days, a piece of black material called crepe was placed over the door to indicate a death in the family. Hanging crepe. There you go. Very, very kind of cold, even when you hear it that way. Uh, they don't pay for nothing. They ran up a two hundred dollar bar bill. Uh, overcharge those college students. Chris is like, this is a good thing. Christopher likes the fact that the captains and the boss are coming to the club. Using the office, it makes him, he has no, he's happy. He likes being and center. The, pla he, the place isn't that, bugged yet. No, but he feels like he's in the center of the, you know, the, the action, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, then Adriana sits in the broken chair uh, and it falls on the ground. Christopher laughs hysterical. We're having Sunday dinner at Tony's and you're coming. I don't care if your mother's dying. What kind of thing is that to say? Horrible, you know. But then he's like, you know what this guy did for me? Something I can't talk about. Something that was ruining my life. And he made it right. What I owe him, I would follow that man into hell. And then, like, not long after this, he's cursing him, saying he doesn't give a shit about me. It's all bullshit. It's, you know, the wind, the, whatever, whichever way the wind blows. You know, you know how it goes. Courtroom, Junior's trial. Uh, lawyer uh, presents the info to the judge. It's Junior's really boring dead. details, really kind of tedious. The post office box was sent, you know, and the deposit was made on the box. Junior's not even paying attention. He's very distracted in the courtroom, isn't well, he? Well, he's staring down the, the, the artist, you know. Uh, and uh, I don't think David liked, you, you didn't see all that much courtroom stuff on The Sopranos. I don't think David likes courtroom stuff. No, and he's, uh, Junior, remember when, the last, first time we see him in trial, he was going over the charges for the, you know, he's, he's, you know, he's focusing on very weird things. It's very you know, boring you know. to me. I feel, a, I kind of, uh, on Blue Bloods, we, we do court stuff, you know, not this season, but uh, I kind of was falling asleep. I didn't have any lines and I was fucking nodding off. Yeah. Garden State Plaza Mall, Adriana's on the phone with her mom. And here comes Agent San Severino waiting for her. Next thing she said, she's her mother saw a psychic about a guy she's dating, and, and Adriana's like, I don't care what the psychic said. Great detail to start the scene. If and he the, doesn't call back in 48 hours, he's not into you. And the mother's no good anyway. Right? Is the mother you put Christopher pushed the mother? Remember that? That was a great scene. Yeah, he pushed the mother, and she uh, uh, she was the bad seed. Patty McCormick. McCormick. Yeah, she was. She's a bad seed. Great, scary yeah. movie. Yeah. A young murderer. Uh, Adriana's in the car with Agent San Severino and Harris. Anything interesting going on? They know shit. Ralph they know that Ralph, Vito, Jean, Eugene, and Patsy were at the club. Uh, they mentioned Giovanni Kogo, and she knows that. She knows what happened to that guy, that he got a beating. Uh, they, t they know that Ralph went to Philadelphia. She's fucked, you know, she doesn't know what to do, and she finally gives some information. I guess this is the first information she actually gives them, right? Yeah, it's nothing. It's Patty. And it's Patsy nothing. Parisi Patsy's got suits. Selling some swag. I used to sell leisure suits when I was in college. Now, what is a leisure suit, exactly? Well, they had the two pockets here. It was horrible look. Is it? Very big in the 70s. It's not one piece, is it? No, no, no. no it's two no. pieces. Not a jumpsuit, but two pieces, kind of uh, uh, really polyester 
shitty uh, looking thing. Is it like waist go up to the waist? Yeah, or is it like three up to quarters? the waist. No, it's like a waist. And uh, have the they come back crazy ever? Or colors no? never made a comeback. I used to like buy them from a guy from like in Queens at a luncheonette. Some guy I knew from college, uh, and it paid like thirty five, thirty seven dollars, and I would sell them for like fifty dollars. Make. 10, 12 50 bucks. That's all it was a lot of money yeah. then. $10, 12 dollars. Were they know. designer? Nah, I don't remember. I used to sell that. I used to also sell women's purses. And then they had like the little one, little key purse, and then the, the big one. I would pay like three dollars for them and sell them for five or six. And you know, I used to, you know, hustle up whenever I could. I didn't steal them. I would buy them from a guy who I assume stole them. Mm. You know. Uh, I never stole them myself. I probably would have made more money, obviously. Uh, Bobby's Kitchen, Janice and Bobby talk. They, Bobby's in a good mood. He was shaved. He shaved. Did you see? He looked better. He's cleaned, he, up. He, he cleaned the Tupperware is ready to go back, which means they're done with the, the all the women the coming to help Bobby. That's all over now. He Janice said, let's go out. The kitchen. It's all cleaned up. It's all set up. It's done with all the other mob wives. You know, the kids like Chinese. Let's go out. Bobby uh, tells her that he did what he had to do and Junior's happy, so they want to celebrate, right? Yep. I ca I ca she tells him she collapsed one time at Hunan Palace. Complete blackout from the MSG. He said, I'll just open a can of soup, meaning it doesn't matter. He just wants to celebrate. Uh, there must be something I could heat up. And she tries again. She With can't Karen get rid Z. of that ZD fast enough. And Bobby, this time, more together, says, I'm not ready for that yet. And he he thanks Janice for everything for pulling him out of his funk. Crazy Horse Office, Adriana walks in. Tony and Ralph are in there talking. Tony, hold on a minute, hon. Uh, Tony, how's our girl? Our girl. You know, it's always something. Uh, you should see the vet bills. Ralph takes big offense that Tony thinks he's, uh, Ralph thinks Tony's weaseling in on pile mine. Well, I think he takes offense because he's like, our girl, I'm the one paying all the bills. Correct. Like if Tony was willing to chip in. He's not happy. He's, he's not, not happy, happy at all. Uh, he's complaining about it. Now Tony wants to switch to the shoes, which means Ralphie's got to pay for them. Titanium. He's got to pay for the guy to put him on. He's got to pay for the shoe. It's all, so he's not, Tony's just, it's win-win. It's all gravy to Tony. He wins, he gets a piece of Ralphie's action. He bets on the horse. Ralph's the one that's got to pay the stable fee, the trainer, the jockey, the vet, you know, the equipment, very all that shit. To, to it's very expensive. Yeah. Uh, Ralph's bedroom, Nina, I guess that's his new girl, brings Ralph food in bed. Inez Munez. Munez, she calls. Nina is played by Sabrino Gennarino, who was in The Walking Dead, Jack Reacher. She's also a screenwriter. And, you know, she kind of reminded me, just physically, a little bit of Tracy. Really? The way she did her hair, something in her, you know, the, you know something in her, the type of, you know, the type of look she had reminded me a little bit of Tracy. I don't know if that was deliberate, but there, I got that vibe a little bit. Uh... Inez says the horse is very, very sick. The horse doctor won't do anything because Mr. Ralph didn't pay the money. Uh, he owes it to him, and the horse might die. She's kind of frantic on the phone, Inez. She's uh, frantic. Uh, you know, the vet won't do anything till he gets paid, and Ralph says these guys, no compassion for the fucking animal. Have her call Tony. Tony. And he has no compassion either, obviously. Imagine, imagine uh, this is the boss of the family. And Ralphie doesn't really give a shit. I mean, no. this is your horse. Does he really love the horse? He doesn't give a shit. No. Now no. it's a now it's an albatross around his neck, uh, you know, that he's got to pay bills all the time. There's no compassion. Tony gets the call. Carmela's still pissed. She's ignoring him. He's watching and, Winston Churchill. Well, he loves World War II movies, Tony. Love, love documentaries on World War II. Loves it. He, he Carmela ignores him a lot. This goes on a lot. This big well, power. they're going through a rough patch. You know, they've been going through a rough patch in the marriage. She's still pissed off that he didn't sign the living trust. 
I mean, um, going to, in the seven episodes of the season of the show, she's pissed off most seasons. <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen, uh, she's getting the trust because she's afraid. You know what I mean? That he might have a if what if he has a kid out of wedlock or some sure. grandma makes a claim to the estate or God knows what. You know, and she's, you know, well, she's, she's seen it happen. Uh, Inez, the horse is sick. The lady says to call you. Who is this? It's Mr. Ralph's housekeeper. Horse is very sick. Need a doctor. How bad is it? They said she, uh, the, the, she may die, and the doctor won't do anything until he gets money. Tony gets dressed. Carmela says, where are you going? You bought a racehorse? He says, no, I got to go pay the vet. And this makes her even more pissed off because, you know, he doesn't have money to invest. She can't invest, but he's, like, messing around with horses. She doesn't really probably believe him. She probably thinks he did buy a racehorse. Uh, Anthony Jr. listening to a band called Deicide, the gift that keeps on giving. Deicide means killer of gods. I guess in AJ was reading Nietzsche and God is dead. Maybe it's kind of a nod to, to that when he was going through that. Uh, Christopher's apartment, Adriana comes home and is shooting heroin. She shoots it into her arm. I mean, we haven't really seen her do that much heroin. No. And that's a big step. I mean, is this the first time the... you think? Do we see her snort a bit or something? Yeah, yeah, but I don't think you never saw her. Never I saw her shoot. But she seems like, it seems like she knows what she's doing. So seems like know she knows what she's doing, but maybe she, you know, there's a suicidal impulse. Um, it's a really great shot after she shoots with the dog, uh, Cosette, on her lap. Yeah, the and then we go from away. her sedating herself in some way with heroin, and that kind of cuts. When we now were with the horse in the stable, the doctor had to give the horse a sedative because when the horse thrashes, there's a danger of its intestines getting twisted. Imagine that. And then you have to maybe put the horse down. Uh. Or surgery uh, or something. Tony walks in with Lois, pouring rain. Uh, I told him you were coming with the money. He finally gave us something to settle her down. Tony, I like that he tells her, you better hope she's going to be all right. Tells, tells the vet. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, here's your fucking money. And uh, it's very sad. Tony, the horse is on his side. Uh, and Tony's sitting there with the horse and the goat. Great, he lights great a cigar. Shot. He find, kind of feels kind of cozy in there with the horse. I mean, I think he. It's know, raining outside. It's raining outside. The then horse, the goat. And Dean Tony. Martin starts to sing "My Rifle, My Pony, and Me," which is obviously very appropriate. That's a song from Rio Bravo, which he was in, which is actually a really good movie, and he's he's good in it too. Was it written by Dean Martin and Ricky Nelson? I think so. Uh, it's a really great shot at the end. The rainy yeah, outside. it's a great moment. No. Tony probably would rather be with animals than with uh, people at times. Yeah, you know, there's something real about it to him. You know, I mean, he talks as talks about Gary Cooper. You know, the, you know who was famous for uh, what is that High Noon, right? Um, there's that Western Gary theme. Gary Cooper was Lou Gehrig to me. He'll always be Lou Gehrig. He'll always be Lou Gehrig. Yeah, I, I hear that. Lou, Lou, Lou. Lou, did you like that movie? The Lou Gehrig story? I never saw it. Are you kidding me? No, never saw it. It's good? Ah, you know, it's an old-time movie, but it's it's okay. It's a classic. You got to watch it. Gotta Babe Ruth plays it. himself. J Jim Gandolfini read the speech that Lou Gehrig made when he retired. Uh, he read it at Yankee Stadium when we were all there. Yeah, that was, that was, amazing. That was fantastic. Yeah. That was fantastic. Now it's time for the Talking Sopranos Ask Me Anything segment. The winner of our AMA Best Question is Mark from Washington, D.C., and we're sending Mark a pair of Bose headphones. The Soprano Cruise trip to Italy showed the difference of perception from an Italian-American's viewpoint versus someone that grew up in Italy. For Stephen Michael, what does being Italian mean to you? I don't know. Good food. Family. Not that, uh, not that other uh, nationalities don't have that, but 
kind of. Oh, but you're not an, you're not another. Well, you it's are kinda, another. It was kind of raised, yeah. kind of raised that way, you know. Even well, though you I, raised more Italian or more Jewish or more both? Italian, more Italian. My oh, mother God. was raised basically Italian. She was adopted. Uh, so, but my mother was raised in that world. So she, she was cooked. adopted by Italians. No, she was adopted oh. by uh, you know uh, the Sally Moskowitz was my grandmother's. Uh, but what was your mother's uh, background? Hep my mother's, uh, we don't really know. Uh, I think her father was, we think, uh, involved with Murder Incorporated. Kind of a Jewish wise guy. Wow. Uh, someone, uh, he got someone pregnant, uh, a younger a Polish uh, woman, and uh, put her up for adoption. And uh, Sally Moskowitz had my, my mother. My mother's maiden name was Lorraine Bernstein. And uh, her father was a Bernstein. And that's all we know. My grandmother lived to be 96. Things are still a little fuzzy. But uh, that's it. But my mother was raised in an Italian neighborhood. And, uh, right. you know, so she cooked Italian and... We all were baptized and, and uh, you know, uh, confirmed and all that stuff. And I think that's what it means kind of to me. You know, the family and even your friends. Italians are just, you know, you, you stay friends a long time. You know people a long time. Yeah. The neighborhood, I'm still friends with those guys. You know, Proud of, There's a lot of pride in being Italian. You know, you know your know, friends, you know your family. A lot, of, a lot about food and parties food, and celebrating. Uh, look at art. I mean, painting, movies, you know, uh, the uh, in, history. Um, I, I, I went to Italy for the first time when I was about 26. And um, my family the, that we have the closest roots to are in Rome and outside of Rome, uh, in Perioles. That's where they, they live. And um, I'll never forget, I drove from the airport to a hotel where I was staying and then checked in and then I went walking around Rome when it was the first time in my life. And it was one of the weirdest experiences I've ever had because um, so much of it felt so familiar. I had never been to a foreign country where A, people looked like, you know, my family and stuff it was one thing. And like smells and sounds and even the light for some, somehow all these things seem so familiar yet it was foreign at the same time never had that experience before never really had it since and it was really you know i had to kind of it was overwhelming in a way i never it was very profound i have to say and i just love i've been many times to Italy and I just love it every time I go now, no matter you where met, I go, you met your relatives in Periolis there when, uh, so, a couple of them came when I was a kid not many. My fa my grandfather, his sister, stayed in Italy. A couple of his sisters stayed in Italy. But when I went there the first time I went, you know, I took the subway to the neighborhood where they were, and they didn't speak any English at the time. And they and uh, the it, the funny thing was they had pasta, right? Um, you know, with tomato sauce, and it tasted just like um, the sauce that they made in the Bronx. Because it was my my grandfather's mother came with him eventually to America, so I guess the recipe was the same in the family. Like it wow. tasted exactly wow. the same. Really blew my mind. Yeah, that's something that, that you know. And the thing that I, you know, people don't understand, don't understand. Uh, I, I'll go into a restaurant, and the sauce. Some restaurants or. I think one, there was a place up here in the East Village. It tasted just like my grandmother's. You know, just whatever whatever it is, whatever she yeah. did, whatever they did, and there's that taste. And Laura, I'll say the same thing with rice. You know, my wife's Mexican-American. And she'll say, that rice tastes like my mother's or my grandmother's. It's a thing. Right. So someone and, knew what they were doing. Obviously, yeah. Because it's authentic, you know. I mean, yeah, that's you, the best you know, compliment if it tastes like it came out of somebody Did they look like you? Was there other imperial? Oh, there? yeah. Very much so. Yeah? And then I went I went years later when I, after I had kids, and we went there for Christmas um, and met a whole bunch of them. 
A lot of them, some live in the city, but the ones that don't live are, are farmers outside the city. You know, they had kiwis. They used to, you know, raise grapes, and now they're, they raise kiwis, kiwi fruit. Um, about three years ago, no, 2017 or eight, no, 18, uh, the, the novel that I wrote was published in Italian by an Italian 